Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the session. Hope all of you guys are back after the lunch break. Just put a confirmation in the chat whether all of you guys are back or not, so that we can accordingly move forward. Is everyone back? Just put a confirmation in the chat if you guys are back. Yes, okay, I can see a confirmation from Pradeep, Prabhat. All right, fine. So let's move forward. So, guys, uh, today our intention was to cover three services. First was speech service. I showed you a demo of it. Now, the second service that we'll cover is document intelligence service. Document intelligence service, as you guys know, is used to scan the document. And uh, if at all you want to want to get any information from it, you can just ask the AI model to get that particular information and to get it for you. So instead of me scanning the document, getting the data from it, okay, which could be a tedious process for me to manually do it, I can use AI model. And I can use that AI model to scan, let's say, 10,000 documents in one go, 10 lakh documents in one go. And it will be able to do scanning of the documents and obtaining information from it in a much better way. All right. So I had given you that example earlier, right? Uh, so uh, at the end of every month, for example, uh, I get an invoice from the company that I'm working with. In that invoice, every detail is mentioned, like what is the compensation amount that I'll get for that month? What is my GST number and so on and so forth. Now I have a habit that I go through that invoice manually, take the compensation amount that is mentioned and copy that compensation amount and paste it in a separate Excel sheet. And in that Excel, in that separate Excel sheet, I cap, I like to keep track of every um, compensation that I have received for all the months in that financial year. But this process that I'm currently doing of extracting data from document, that process is done, is done manually by me. What if I want to automate this process? Okay, uh, then we can do it with help of this service called Document Intelligence Service. It will help you to automate that information extraction process. Also, um, another field you could apply this is let's say you're working in a government agency wherein your task is to scan, let's say, thousands of documents every day and obtain information from it. Take information from that document, put it in a separate place similarly take information from the second document put it in a separate place and so on like that suppose your job is to scan thousands of documents now if you do that manually it could be tedious for you instead why don't you use this document intelligence service and you can pass it any number of documents that you want and it will go ahead scan data from it and obtain any information that you want it to okay so fine so document intelligence service helps us to scan documents and obtain data from it all right, so since I want to work with document intelligence service, I will have to create a resource of it. You guys know in Azure, it's a rule. Whenever we want to use any service of Azure, we have to create a resource of it. Similarly, if I want to use the document intelligence service, I will have to create a resource of that service. So let me do that. Let me try to search for document intelligence service. I can see an option for it in my search result. Let me click on it. And now, what I want to do, I want to create a resource of this service. So I'll click on the create button to create a resource. When I click on the create button, I'm redirected to a form that I have to fill. So let me fill in the details of the form. The first field in the form is asking me to select subscription. As you guys know that in your Azure account, you can create more than one subscriptions, each having different permissions in it and each having different amount of money uploaded into it. So you can choose the subscription of your choice. Currently, there are two subscriptions available with me. Let me choose any one. All right. After that, the next field is asking me to assign my resource to a resource group. Currently, I'm creating a resource of document intelligence service. So it is asking me to put that resource in some resource group. In Azure, there is a rule that whatever resource you are creating, that resource has to fall within some of the other resource group. OK, so either you can create an existing resource group. Sorry, either you can choose an existing resource group or create a new one. So let me choose an existing resource group. So for our first lab, if you remember the one that we performed before the lunch break, we had worked with a resource group called Webinar RG. 
for our second lab as well, for our second demo as well, we'll choose the same resource group. So that will help me to manage the resources better. All right. After that, it is asking me to choose the region in which my resource will lie. Uh, here, choose the region that is closer to your user for better latency. Okay. However, East US right now is suffering from a lot of traffic issues. So let me select a different region as compared to that. Let me select Sweden Central. After that, it is asking me to assign a name to my resource. So let me give it a name and let me call it Webinar Document Intelligence Resource. Then at last, it is asking me to choose a pricing tier for my resource. There are two options available, free and standard. With free tier, you will not be charged for usage. However, for standard tier, you will be charged for usage. However, the disadvantage of free tier is that there are a lot of limitations with respect to usage. Okay, for example, it says um, with free tier, you can only use, you can only call the resource uh, one time per minute. Okay, whereas in standard tier, uh, one second, if I go below, it says one call, acha for training, acha this for training. What about for resource? For resource, it says, 20 calls, okay, 20 calls per minute. Okay, whereas in standard tier, you can see there is no limitation with respect to calling the resource for usage. Uh, this last uh, uh, information that you see is for creating a custom model in this service, for training a custom model. Okay, fine. For training a custom model, uh, anyways, we are not going to do that in our, this lab. Uh, currently, we want to use an existing model. So in order to use the existing model, you can see with free tier, uh, you have a limitation of 20 calls per, lim per minute. Whereas in standard tier, you can, you don't have those limitations over here. So with free tier, you won't be charged for usage. However, there are limitations with respect to usage. With standard tier, you will be charged for usage. However, those limitations, most of the limitations uh, are not present with standard tier. Okay, let me choose standard tier. That's the better one. Yes, it will charge me for usage, but it's the best tier that you can choose from. Uh, after that, let me keep network settings, identity related settings, and other settings default. I will directly jump to review plus create. These network settings, identity settings, I'll explain ahead to you in this lecture only. Okay? But for now, let me skip it. And I directly want to jump to review plus create. So I'm saying all the network settings keep it default, or the, all the identity settings keep it default. Directly jump to review plus create. Fine, we have done that. And now Azure ran a validation in the background just to check if it can give me the things that I'm asking for. If the validation is successful, then the create button will be enabled. And now you can see it has been enabled. Let me click on it. And with this, a resource of document intelligence service will be created. Once the resource is created, we'll see what to do next. So let us wait for around two minutes for our resource to get created. Now, Manthan has a doubt. Manthan says that he has a problem currently. He says in Visual Studio Code, translating is okay. Visual Studio Code. He's not speaking it. Uh, currently, I have changed my resource key. Uh, so if you're using the same key as earlier, it will not work. Okay, so let me give you my new key. You can paste that. And uh, let's see your problem. Let's see why your problem is coming. So I'll do one thing. First, I'll give you my new key. And then I will uh, give you access to share your screen. So before we move on to the second demo, let's solve the issue of the first demo. So I'll give you my new key over here, Manthan. Let's wait. And let me go to my resource group. Before the lunch break, I created a resource of speech service. Let me go inside that. And now under resource management section, I'll be able to see the key of my resource. I changed my key. I regenerated that key. Uh, let me give you a different key now. Above there was a regenerate button, so I changed my first key. Uh, now let me share with you my second key. Okay, so Manthan, do one thing. Um, raise your hand in the chat so your name comes at the top of the list so I can give you presenter access. So if possible, raise your hand so that your name comes at the top 
otherwise i will have to search for your name manually in the participant list or fine i have found your name no need to raise your hand i have found your name over here in the participant list and i have made you the presenter so manthan i have made you the presenter you can share your screen whenever you are ready are you there manthan hello manthan i have made you the presenter if you want to share your screen yes you can share Sir, your screen ah. mobile acha you are on mobile acha fine so whenever you join if possible if it is possible for you to join on laptop you can do that so that you can then you know share your error on the screen and then i can okay. show you the solution okay fine so then i understand what to do now acha okay okay fine all right so let's proceed guys and uh, what we'll do now is we'll move on to our second demo our second demo or our second lab today is on document intelligence service so we have created a resource of the service and this resource will use to scan documents so let me show you the document that will scan it's a invoice document by the way so for different type of documents azure has created different ai models for scanning invoice documents azure has created a different model for scanning aadhar card document azure has created a different model and so on okay let me show you with that so i'll go to my document intelligence resource and guys here if i want to interact with this resource there are two ways one is using the without code option second is using the with code option if you want to use the without code option click on this button called go to studio and you will be able to interact with the document intelligence resource without code let's wait for our page to fully load and the point that i was trying to make guys is that for different type of documents azure has created different model okay so for working with invoices we have a separate model then for working with uh, credit card documents we have a different model and so on like that we have different model for um, different different type of documents you can view the um or tutorial page on azure to see the different type of models that are created so for example let me search for the names of those models over here i'll go ahead search for the names of those models so for invoice document we have a model uh, i think the name is pre built invoice something like that for other type of documents we have other ai models all right let me show that to you so uh, let me click on get get started Mm. and let's see if it's there in this documentation page i'll learn more okay let me click on this button learn more so i wanted to show you the ready made ai models under this category of service called document intelligence service and i wanted to show you for different type of documents we have different models okay so you can see for invoice we have a model called pre built invoice this is the model name okay similarly for different other types we have different different models let's say for uh, let me go to the left hand side and search the different type of document let's say it's a uh, what should i select mortgage or let's let me select id id document okay so id means what like for example let's say you have your aadhar card pan card and so on okay so if you want to scan those documents then what is the model that you will use so you can see that this uh, model the model name is called pre built id document this is the model name and it can be used to scan which type of documents it says it can be used to scan passbook passport then driving license from america europe india canada so even india's driving license can be scanned with help of this model okay even indian pan card and aadhar card can be scanned with help of this model and so on so the point that i am trying to make is for different type of documents you have different ready made models created okay however in our current demonstration the one that i will be showing to you 
I want to work on an invoice document. Let me show that document first, how it looks like. I'll go ahead and show that document. Okay, let me copy my invoice and let me paste it in my current folder that I'm working with. It's called August webinar folder. Let me paste it over there. All right, fine. So in my current working folder, I'll paste my invoice and then I will show it to you. All right, I have pasted it now. I have clicked on control V to paste it and it has been pasted now. All right, and now let me show you that particular invoice and how it looks like. So this is how the invoice looks like over here. This is the entire invoice. You can see it in the school of Visual Studio. Let me open it outside as well. You can open it outside as well. It's a basic invoice in PDF format. Okay. And you can see this the invoice. What I want to do is I don't want uh, to manually go through the details mentioned in it. I will ask my AI model to scan this document and give me the information that I want. Okay, so let's see how to do it. So currently, I have created a resource of document intelligence service, right? This is my resource. Let me go to the resource. And now that I have created a resource of document intelligence service, what I will do is I'll try to interact with it. There are two ways to interact. One is using the without code approach. So you can click on this go to studio button and interact with the resource without code. Second approach is to interact with the resource with code. And I prefer the with code approach a lot because using the with code approach, I can then customize my results if I want to. Okay. So let me not use the without code approach. I will use the with code approach. Okay, so in order to use the with code approach, I'll create a coding file. Let me do that over here. Create a coding file. Okay, let me call it analyze. I'll say scan.py. All right. And currently I've created a resource of document intelligence service in order for me to use the resource using the with code uh, option, or I should put it in another way. I've created a resource of document intelligence service in order for me to interact with the resource using the with code option. First, I will have to authenticate to the resource. Okay, um, it's not like everybody will be able to gain access to the resource. Only the people who have the necessary authentication, they will be given access. So in order to gain access over here, I will currently require two things. Okay, first is the key of the resource. And second is the endpoint of the resource. These are the two things that I will require. In order to authenticate to speech resource, I required key and region, right? That we had seen before the lunch break. However, currently we are authenticating to document intelligence resource. So in order to interact with this resource, you need two things, key and endpoint. So different resources have different rules. Uh, some resources require region, some resources require endpoint. See, if you use region or endpoint, doesn't matter. It's just that different resources have different rules for authentication. Okay, fine. And um, you see in your endpoint over here, which is nothing but your resource link. The only thing that changes um, over here, fine, I guess currently the name of the region is not matter. Okay, in some endpoints, the name of the regions are mentioned. Okay, fine. Over here, it's not mentioned. Okay, not to worry. All right, so the point that I was trying to make was that different resources have different rules for authentication. Uh, if you remember a speech resource required key and region for authentication, whereas our document intelligence resource requires key and endpoint for authentication. All right, so let's pass these two things over here. I'll take my key of the resource and I'll take my endpoint of the resource. Using these two things, I'll gain authentication. Okay, let's see. So first, let me mention the key of my resource. I'll go ahead and mention the key. Uh, and now you can see that information in the overview section as well. If you don't see it in the overview section, you can go under resource management 
and there also under keys and endpoint you can see that same information all right so let me go ahead and let me take the two things that i need to get authentication to my resource first is the key of my resource so let me take my key and paste it in my code second is the endpoint of my resource so let me take that and put it in my code All right, now that this is done, let's move forward and we'll try to gain authentication using these two things. In order to do it, I will need help of a class which I will import. So from Azure folder, there is a subfolder called AI. Inside that subfolder, I have a file called form recognizer. And inside that file, I have a class called document analysis client. This is the class that will help me to gain authentication. So let me go ahead, let me call the class. And I'll pass two things inside of it. First is the endpoint of the resource. So let me do that. Let me pass the endpoint of the resource. And the second thing that I will do is I'll pass the key of the resource. But here, as per rules, I can't pass the key directly. Uh, I will have to pass it with help, with help of a function which I will import. So from Azure folder, there is a subfolder called core. Inside that subfolder, I have a file called credentials. And inside that file, I have this function called Azure key credential and through this function, I'll pass my key. So here as for rules, I can't pass the key directly. I will have to pass it with the help of a function. So all those rules you will get to know from the documentation page. OK, fine. So all we have to do is follow those rules. All right. And uh, with this, I have passed my two things over here. First is the endpoint of the resource. And second is the key of the resource. With help of these two things, authentication will be done. And if the authentication is successful, access to the resource will be granted. So if there is no error while, gain, while gaining access to the resource, I just want to print a confirmation message to the user that access to resource has been granted. Access to resource has been granted. Okay, fine. Let's go ahead and uh, let's run our code and let's see access to resource has been granted or not. If it's granted, then we'll do our remaining work. OK, access to resource has been granted. Fine. Now let's move forward and uh, let's interact with our resource. So I will need three main things uh, after gaining authentication. First is I will have to specify my model um, name Okay, or my model ID, I should say. So which model you want to use for scanning the document? So for invoice document, you have different model. For scanning Aadhaar card document, you have a different model and so on, right? So let me go to the documentation. Now I know for invoice document, I have a model called pre-bit invoice. Let's say if you didn't know, then how would you do it? Go to this documentation page. I'm giving you a link of it in the chat over here. I'm giving you a link of it in the chat. And now, what I will do is I will search for the type of document that I'm working with. I'm working with currently invoice document. So I'll click on that option. And if I go below, the model ID will be mentioned. It will be called pre-built invoice. That's the name, pre-built invoice. And you can see that's the same name mentioned. I'll take this name, copy it, and paste it in my code. So this is the first thing that I require for interacting with my resource. The second thing that I require is I'll need to mention the language in which the document was written. So I'll say it's in English language. So I'll just mention that that is in English language. OK, after that, what I will need is third and last thing that I'll need is I'll need to I'll need the document itself. Now there are two ways you can mention pass the entire document uh, to the resource or you can pass the URL of the document. Both the things work. OK. So let me show you that URL part because many a times it's not possible for us to download the document in a local file system and then work on it. So let's say you just have the URL of it. So let's say this is the URL. From this URL, this particular invoice has been obtained. Okay. Uh, so it's been obtained from a URL. So this uh, invoice was uploaded on GitHub and this is the link of it. Okay. So you can take the link also and work with it. It's not necessary that from the link first you have to download the document and then only work with it. 
you can pass the link directly as well. So let's say I have the document link. Okay, I'll mention the link. Now using these three things, using these three things over here, I will go ahead and uh, try to interact with my resource. Let's see how to do it. So first I will ask my resource that, okay, now that I've gained access to you, please go ahead and please begin analyzing the document from the URL. Please begin analyzing the document from the URL. Okay, so we are all past these important things. First is my model ID. Second is my document URL. And third is the language in which uh, this document was written. So I will say that it's a, it has been written in English language. So let me pass on that information as well. Fine, with this, the act, uh, resource will begin analyzing the document and uh, Fine, so it will try to do analysis over here. Now, once it has done the analysis, what I want to do is I want it to give me the result of the analysis. So for it to give me the result of the analysis, I'll call the result method over here. And that code will give me the result of the analysis. And I'll store that result in a variable. That okay, this is the result that I obtained from my resource. Once I obtain the result from my resource, I'll just print it to you. So it's a raw result. It won't make sense to you at first, but don't worry. We'll try to simplify it. So it's a raw result. Let me run the code again. Okay, currently I have an error. It says that there's some spelling mistake. My mistake. It should be begin. Begin analyzing. So there's a spelling mistake over here. Let me correct it. It should be begin analyzing document. Okay. Now that I've corrected my spelling, let's move forward. And you will get your analysis result. It will be a raw result. So the raw result will not make sense to you at first. And you can see your raw result over here. It's a big result that you are getting. And as expected, it won't make sense to you at first. Okay, fine. So what I will do is um, I want it to get information about the different. Uh, okay, let me just check over here. It must have scanned. Uh, different documentation pages. Although currently in my invoice, I have only one documentation page. Okay, so let me do it. I'll say, give me information about only the documentation pages. Other things I don't want. Let's see, what do we get? I'll go ahead, try to run the code again. First of all, I'll just clear this result from my terminal. Let's run it again. Again, it will give me some raw result. It's still not refined yet. I have to refine it. So again, the raw result that will be shown will not make sense to you, but we'll try to refine it. And you can see this is the raw result over here. What I want is, uh, okay, so this is the result of first document. Where is it? Ending, one second. Let me expand this. Okay. Analyzing document. Okay, I'm getting many, many things over here. Fine, let's do one thing. Let's refine it. And currently the format is not at all readable. So let me convert it to a readable format. I'll convert it to a dictionary. Okay, so I'll use the enumerate function to convert this entire result to a dictionary. Okay, in a dictionary, we know we have a key and value pair. Let me call that key. By a, uh, let me reference that key by a variable called ID and let me reference the value of the dictionary by a variable called receipt field. Okay, receipt field. All right, with this, what will happen is I'm uh, taking my raw result and converting it to dictionary format so that it's more readable for me. Okay, once it's converting to dictionary format, I will say that, okay, you are getting the receipt fields. But for those receipt fields, please go ahead and mention the name of each field for which you have scanned information. So with this, what it will do it is it will give me the names of each and every field for which it has scanned information. Let me show that to you. Let me run the code. And now it will give me the names of each field for which I, for which it has scanned information. Okay, it will give me the name of each field for which it has scanned information. Okay, currently, um, let's see, field, this is fine. 
now let me do one thing over here. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. So this issue is occurring because, okay, so currently this code is only pointing to the below result. The above result, this all this above result is being obtained because of the earlier print statement. So let me remove that because I don't want it. Okay, that's why I was confused. Why are we getting that? I converted to dictionary from that dictionary. I got key value pairs. In my value, I had the receipt field names and all I'm doing is getting the names as expected that OK, this is the name of the field for which information is obtained. This is the name of the field for which information is obtained and so on. Now let me get the value inside of each of the fields. For example, if I ask my document that gives me the vendor name. OK, now I know in my document, my invoice document that the vendor name is. Quanto so limited. Let me ask this AI model whether it has analyzed it correctly or not. Let me ask it what is the vendor name mentioned in the invoice. And if the analyzing done by the AI model is correct, it should give me a vendor name of Quanto So Limited. So I will ask it over here that okay, you have got the received fields. Okay, now among the fields that we have mentioned, get the value for a field called vendor name. Get the value. For a field called vendor name. So it will go ahead and get us the value for that field called vendor name and hopefully it should say Quanto so limited. OK, so at the start I'll just mention my code that vendor name is. OK, whatever the AI model tells us, let's see. So hopefully if my AI model work correctly, it should give me a vendor name of Ponto so limited. Let's see if it does that. Let's see if it does that or no. And you can see it says that my vendor name is Ponto so limited. OK, similarly uh, my invoice ID. OK, I know that in my document that my invoice ID is INV 100. Let's see if my AI model also fuse the same or not. OK, so I will ask it. Give me the invoice ID. So I'll say give me the value of this field called invoice ID. OK, and that's what I'll print. So let's see what is the invoice ID that is obtained. Hopefully it says that invoice ID is INV 100. If it does not, that means the model did not work well. Let's see if it does it correctly. The invoice ID should be INV 100. And yes, it does say that that invoice ID is INV 100. Like that for these fields, you can obtain the values. So you don't have to manually scan the document and get the value for the fields in the in the document. Um, that scanning part will be done by this AI model. And currently I've only worked on one document. You can scale this to multiple documents. OK, here in Python you can use a for loop and uh, you can uh, loop through, let's say, thousands of documents in, in one go. OK, and get the result that you want. Fine, so like this, uh, you can work with your document intelligence resource. So document intelligence um, uh, resource uh, allows you over here to scan the documents that you want, whether it's an invoice document, Aadhaar card document, any document. You have some uh, pre-built models present over there. All right, fine. So this was about document intelligence. Before the lunch break, we talked about speech service. So I showed you a demo of it. After the lunch break, I talked about document intelligence service and I showed you a, a demo of the same over here. What you can do is you can try this out. I'll take my code, send it to you in your uh, uh, chat and uh, let me show you. Let me send it to you in your chat. So you can copy paste my code and it will work. OK, you can copy paste my code and it will work. OK, um, Mayu says, is there any relation between file local and regin? Regin? I didn't understand regin. What do you mean by that? Is this a spelling mistake or are you trying to say something else? OK, file local means that in that file, uh, the values are mentioned in which language? So I said that, OK, it's mentioned in English language. 
my os is parallel execution yes it's just that you will need another library for doing that but yes it's possible right and especially if you are trying to interact with the resource using the with code option using the with code option you can do a lot of customizations okay so in your case mayur um, it will be better if you use let's say spark architecture to do parallel execution so yes you can do that okay so all those customizations can be done okay uh, so currently i only worked on one document you can work on multiple documents like that okay uh, you can parallelly process them all of that can be done yes okay but my main goal was to show you how to work with this uh, document intelligence resource normally so before the lunch break i showed you how to work with the speech resource after the lunch break i showed you how to work with document intelligence resource okay so with this two services uh, we have covered first was speech service second was document intelligence service right where did that document uh, where did that page go ha this is the page so uh, i wanted to cover three services today one was speech service second was document intelligence third was open ai out of the three two i have already done i have already talked to you about speech service i have already talked to you about document intelligence service now let me move on to open ai service okay so let me move on to that open ai service over here so guys in order to uh, use the open ai service we'll have to create a resource of that service right in order to use the open ai service we'll have to create a resource of it so let's go ahead and let's create a resource but before that i can see a notification in the chat let me see if there is any doubt mentioned acha mayur says region no 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 a region is completely different a region um, means that okay at which place your resource was stored so azure has created servers across the globe so you want to place your resource in which server of azure so for that you choose the region file local is different file local means that okay the language in this particular uh, document is which language is it is it hindi language is it english language or what okay so here i mentioned english language okay if it was hindi language you will mention the code for it hi if it's kannada language you will mention the code for it kannada and so on okay. so file local means that okay you are scanning a document but what was the uh, language mentioned in the document that you are scanning so these two things are completely different region is different file local is completely different okay atul says code is working okay perfect and that's why i use the url approach guys because if i had not used the url approach you would have to download the invoice in your laptop and then work on it so to avoid that i use the url approach if you want to use the url approach you can uh, have there is a way to pass the document directly as well you can do that as well both the things are fine although the url approach is much much simpler it avoids um i mean it does not require you to first download the document in your local laptop and then work on it okay you can work on it without downloading as well okay so anyways the point that i was trying to make was today i wanted to cover three services one was speech service which i have done second was document intelligence service which i have done third was open ai service so let me show you how that works okay so what i will try to do is um, i will since i want to work with open ai service i will have to create a resource of it so let me go ahead and let me create a resource over here so first i will try to search for azure open ai and i can see an option for it in my search result let me click on that what do i want to do since i want to use the open ai service i will have to create a resource of it so let's go ahead and let's create a resource so i click on the create button to create a resource when i do that i am redirected to a form that i have to fill so let me fill in the details of the form over here so guys the first field in the form is asking me to select subscription okay as you guys know that in your um, azure account you can create more than one subscriptions each having different amount of permissions assigned to it and each having different amount of money uploaded into it currently i have two active subs i can use any one let me select the second one after that next it is asking me to assign a name to my resource sorry 
not name i should say that it is asking me to put my resource into a resource group in azure there is a rule that whenever you are creating any resource it has to fall within some of the other resource group as you know there are a lot of benefits of resource group in short you can remember that resource group helps you for better management of resources so you can either select a existing resource group or create a new one let me select the existing resource group called webinar rg the same resource group i used it for my first and second lab and the same one i will use it for my third lab as well okay now let's move forward after that it is asking me to assign my resource to a particular region now guys unlike the speech resource where region didn't matter unlike the document intelligence resource where region didn't matter here in open ai resource the region does matter different regions have access to different open ai models so some open ai models will have access to sorry some regions will have access to all open ai models some regions will act, will have access to only few open ai models and so on so you information over here from the documentation page so for example if i show you azure open ai region support i'll show you the documentation page and from there you can find that information the best region that you can choose from as far as uh, model support is concerned is east us best region that you can choose from is east us let me show you the reason uh, uh, let me show you why that is the case let me check is there a option for a region is there a link for it somewhere let me scroll below ha ah, here is here is the table okay and you can see for different regions different models are supported above you can see the names of the different different uh, open ai models in chat gpt currently um, you have gpt4 model that is used okay previously be before gpt4 you had gpt3.5 and so on okay so different models are used for different tasks but fine the main thing that i wanted to show you is um, here in open ai Uh, choosing region does matter because different regions will have access to different open ai models the best region that you can choose is east us because you can see in east us i mean you have access to majority of the models over here okay majority of the models uh, so i prefer east us okay because majority of my uh, useful models are there okay the word i should use is useful okay so i prefer east us however because east us is so good uh, that's why there is a lot of uh, traffic issues also over there most of the people try to upload it on east us so to avoid those traffic issues you can select any other region that you want let me select another one called sweden central okay this region will have access to different open ai models but fine anyways i want to use one model only and i guess in sweden central i will have that one important model that i want to use let's see uh, which one i get access to although that information you can obtain from this page also okay i'll give you a link of this in the chat so you can go and explore that region wise support all right fine coming back to our resource creation so we were asked to choose a region for our resource we did that then we are being asked to assign a name to our resource so let's give it a name we'll call it webinar open ai res that means webinar open ai resource after that it is asking me to choose a pricing tier okay uh, normally you would see two options free and standard but currently i have exhausted the limit of free tier so only standard tier will be shown to me and you can see only standard tier is shown i have exhausted the limit of free tier that's why it does not show to me let me click on next button and now it is asking me to do network configuration so guys choosing the first option over here uh, means that your resource will be accessible using a public endpoint and any person who has the necessary authentication 
will be able to access your resource using a public endpoint provided they have the they have the necessary authentication and in fact that was the same default setting that we were choosing for our previous resources as well whether it was a resource of document intelligence service whether it was a resource of speech service same network setting was being used behind the scenes that our resource had a public endpoint and anybody could use our resource using the public endpoint provided they have the necessary authentication okay whereas choosing the second option over here choosing the second option means that yes your resource will have a public endpoint but you can limit access to certain ip addresses that you trust you can limit access to certain ip addresses that you trust okay so for example let's say you are working in an office you are working in an it department there are four people over there and you want to give access to only these four people so what you will do you will select the second option and mention the ip addresses of those four people and only only if access is being done using those using any one out of those four ip addresses then only access will be given otherwise access to resource won't be given okay fine so that was about the second option however choosing the third option what you can do is let's say you don't want uh, to use public internet for access you want to use a private network okay you don't want public internet for access ac accessing the first and second option use public internet let's say you want to you have a private network see in most of the companies nowadays they have their own private network okay so let's say if they have if in your company you have a private network and you only want to give access to that private network then you can go ahead and do that you can select the third option with that first we'll have to design your private network should be there okay and uh, that will unnecessarily complicate things for you but it's the most secure option security wise is the best option but unnecessarily it will complicate things for you you'll have to create a private network first then mention that only give access to people who are accessing this private network and so on okay fine so here in private network we have a private endpoint unlike the first and second uh, option we use, which use a public endpoint here in private network the endpoint that is used the private endpoint okay anyways however uh, i will choose the first option only which is the default one let me click on the next button and then i'm being asked to do tag configuration so tags are nothing but name value pairs that you can assign to a resource so it will help you to search for a resource in a better way so for example let's say i created 100 open ai resources let's say i created 100 open ai resources and now i want to search the search for the resource that i created for this webinar now how would i do it uh, you might say that okay search by name so for example i have assigned a name over here called webinar open ai harris but how do i know that this resource is for a webinar that i conducted in the month of august or july or so on so what you can do is uh, instead of mentioning the entire story in the name which can unnecessarily uh, lengthen your name of the resource what you can do is you can go to tag section and here you can assign multiple tags so for example i will say that this resource has been created in the month of what so i guess it's created in the month of august like that you can assign different tags and then what was the purpose so i will say purpose was to just give the tutorial okay then uh, i will mention for which course was it so i will say that okay it was for a course of ai 102 and so on so like that i can assign different tags just like if we have clothes in a shop what do shopkeepers do they assign tags to clothes right that helps them to um, search for clothes i mean organize i mean search for clothes in a better way okay so for example if you ask that okay give me denim jeans then Uh, clothes that have a tag of de denim jeans are extracted and so on okay so tags help you to search for something faster so similarly over here to resources you can assign any tag that you want uh, here in while assigning a tag you have to do two things assign a tag name as well as tag value 
you can assign any tag name that you want you can assign any tag value that you want however in our, in my current lecture i won't do that um, let me not assign any tag whatsoever currently it's not going to be difficult for me okay um, this is especially useful if for a resource group you are creating multiple resources however currently uh, for my resource group i will only create one open ai resource so it won't matter as much okay uh, fine let me click on the next button with this now azure is doing a validation just to check if it can give me the things that that i am asking for if the validation is successful then the create button will be enabled and you can see the create button has been enabled i can click on it and with that a resource of open ai service will be created okay i guess sailesh has raised his hand sailesh if you have any doubt do ask i can see your hand raised however i don't see your query in the chat so i think it might be i think sailesh has raised his hand by mistake but sailesh if you have any query you can ask it in the chat if you cannot ask it in the chat let me know i will uh, give you access to unmute your mic and then you can ask okay but i guess that hand acha any doubt sailesh i can see your answer in the chat any doubt no okay fine so i guess that hand raise was by mistake okay let's proceed so over here let me click on the create button with that resource of open ai service will be created uh, mayur has posted something mayur says can we assign tags ha ah, yes mayur so you can assign any tag name any tag value that you want so for example i will say that this has been created for which team so i will say this has been created for ITT and so on. Like that, you can assign any tag name, any tag value that you want. I won't do that, but you can assign any tag name, any tag value that you want. Okay, fine. So if you remember previously, while creating the resources, I was not showing you network configuration, tag configuration. I had told you that we'll see it right. So I have explained that network configuration, tag configuration over here. So every resource has almost the same network configuration, tag configuration. Okay, fine. Now with this, let me go ahead and let me create a resource of OpenAI service. We'll have to wait for around two to three minutes for the resource to get created, and then we'll see what to do next. So what I will do is other tabs in my browser I will close. Okay, because unnecessarily it will put a load on my CPU. Okay. and uh, currently we are in our third lab our first lab was to work with speech service our second lab today was to work with document intelligence service our third lab today is to work with open ai service so guys um, what uh, azure has done is that is that it has tied up with open ai company so whatever models open ai creates it makes it available on azure platform as well So OpenAI company is the one who created ChatGPT tool. ChatGPT is a very popular tool used in the market nowadays. I guess many of you already know about that tool. So that tool was made by OpenAI. So behind the scenes, what happens in that ChatGPT tool? Behind the scenes, some model is working, right? Some model is working behind the scenes. Right. So we'll do a same thing over here. Is just that here we'll get access to multiple models, not just one. Okay. fine let me go to the resource and now guys there are two ways to interact with the resource one is using the without code approach second is using the with code approach let me show you both so if you want to use the without code approach you will click on this button called go to studio and with that you will be able to interact with your resource without any code okay let me show that to you the resource the without code approach also and the approach also let me show you the without and now i will be able to interact with the model in my resource so i am just waiting for the studio to launch so that i can show you the without code approach it's taking a lot of time this is unusual Okay, I hope within ten seconds it should load. Let's wait till then. I guess there might be some connection issue from my end. Let's 
wait again. Okay, the studio is launching. So as I explained that I'll be showing you two approaches. One is the without code approach. Second is the with code approach. Let me show you the without code approach first. Here, guys, um, yes, we'll get access to multiple models. But in order to use a model, you first have to make it live. Okay, you first have to make it live. Another word for making it live is deploying. So you first have to deploy that model. Only then you will be able to use that model. So let me go to deployment section on the left hand side and let me make a model live or in other words, let me deploy that model. So I'll click on create deployment button. And then I'll mention my name of the deployment. I will say this is just a test deploy that I'm doing. Which model do I want to deploy? Now see in Sweden Central, you will get access to comparatively less number of open AI models. Other regions have access to more and so on. Uh, let me use a model that is used in uh, chat GPT. So in chat GPT nowadays, GPT 4.0 oh is used. Previously, GPT 4 was used. Before that, GPT 3.5 was used and so on. Okay, each model has different capability. So for example, let me show you GPT 4. Okay, it says, okay, quota already ex uh, exhausted. Fine, let me show you 4.0 then. Ah. So with 4.0, you will get access to more number of tokens that you can process behind the scenes. What is tokens? Tokens can be thought of as words or subwords. Okay, tokens can be thought of as words or subwords. Okay, so it depends on how that model was made. And based on that, um, whenever you are passing any input to the model, it will divide that input into many, many tokens. And whether uh, whenever our output is generated, uh, basically the output is also in the form of tokens. Is it that those tokens are shown to you uh, one after the other? Okay, so basically here the model understands things in the form of tokens. So whenever we give it an input, it will break it down into tokens. Tokens can be thought of as words or subwords. So if I ask it a statement like "How are you?", okay, if I ask a statement like that, "How are you?" Then how will be one token, R will be another token, U will be another token, so three tokens. If I put a percentage sign, percentage sign is another token, so this will be my fourth token and so on. So it depends how tokens are generated. Tokens can be thought of as words or subwords. So if you have a word like uh, Apple, it will be treated as one token only. Whereas if you have a word like blueberries, it, will, could, it could be treated as two tokens. Blue could be one token and berries could be another token. So, so on. So it depends on how that model was made. Currently, we don't have any control over the model creation. So we won't have any control over how the tokens are generated. But you can think of tokens as words or subwords. So your different different models have different capabilities. So for example, GPT-35 Turbo 16K has a limit of 16,000 tokens. Okay, different models have different capability of tokens. So currently I'm working with GPT-40. GPT-40 has much, much higher capacity of tokens. Okay, let me show that to you. Fine, here it is asking me to select model version. I will say auto update to default. Sometimes what might happen is guys, let's say there are two versions of models, one, two. Okay, and let's say one is the default version. Now what might happen is with time, let's say another version is launched, version three. And now version one has been deprecated. So because it has been deprecated, now your default number will go to your second version. All right. So what if you had deployed a model with the first version? It is now deprecated. Let's say it has been removed by the company. It, is, it has been deprecated. What will happen? So that's why it's important to select this option called auto update to default. That means, okay, if my current, that, that means choose the default version that is set currently. Let's say with time your default version changes, then auto update to that updated default version. Okay, so it's uh, good to select that option called auto update to default. Fine. After that, uh, next it is asking me to select deployment type standard tier. Um, here I want to use the free tier. Okay, anyways, I don't have the um, uh, option to choose free tier over here because I have exhausted the limits. But if at all I had the option, it would come, come and drop down over here, but I'll select standard only. Then it says that, okay, behind the scenes, how many tokens it should process because 
fine you will give a input to the model but behind the scenes it will process on the data on it on which it was framed so for processing that behind the scenes data so you want to set a if you want to set a rate limit you can do that over here okay that per limit only process these many tokens and so on then content filter that when your model gives you a response um in your response uh, just to ensure that there are no bad words no nothing inappropriate is there for that you can employ a content filter so you can use microsoft's default content filter you can use open ai's default content filter i like to use open ai's default content filter but you can use microsoft default content filter as well if you want to design your own content filter you can go to the left hand side and create your own content filter with that you can specify that okay these words we do, i do not want in my output okay so you can mention those bad words that you don't want in your output fine however i do i will not create my own content filter let me choose open ai's default content filter that's quite good with this i am deploying the model in other words in simple words i am making the model live in order to use a open ai model first i have to make it live and over here you will see that now my model has been made live now that it has been made live i will go ahead and i will try to use it okay so first let me explain the different sections to you uh, the the different menu options that you see on the left hand side so the first option is the home option at the top here you will be seeing various shortcuts uh, to do various tasks and also below you will see the documentation links so you can go through those documentation links to perform those tasks okay below that you have a section called early access playground So guys, here you get access to work with OpenAI models that have not been fully launched in the market yet. Okay, so if at all uh, OpenAI company has created a model, they want to test it out and see uh, if users are able to work on it correctly or not. They what they do? They give access to such newly created models in this um, section called early access playground. So you can see they have created a new version of this model. on 6th of august 2024 so it is asking you to interact with that new version and see how it is behaving but make sure that in this section called early access playground do not pass any sensitive data because what happens in this section um, the open ai company uh, tracks everything okay that okay how is the uh, model behaving to the users input and so on okay so everything is tracked by open ai where so if in case the model gives a bad response then the same uh, uh, logs are then sent to open ai and then open ai company works on it okay so this entire thing is tracked so that's why don't pass any sensitive data over here avoid passing sensitive data this is just to work with newly created models that have not been fully launched in the market yet okay so you can work with those models so um with this it's a win win situation for uh, uh, us as well as well as open ai uh, the uh, good thing about this is okay we get to work with new models ones that have not been launched in the market yet a uh, good thing for open ai is that your while the users are interacting with this model if at all there are if at all there are any issues with this model they can rectify it now itself before launching it fully in the market okay fine so this is about this section called early access playground then below you have two more sections one is chat actually it should be called chat completion and below that you have just completion so what is the difference between chat completion and just completion so guys in chat completion you get access to models that remember the previous chat history that remember the previous chat history whereas in just completion you get access to models that do not remember previous chat history so guys uh previously what used to happen was whatever models open ai was was creating though with those models yes you could chat and it will give you a response back but that model did not remember previous chat history okay and many a times it's important to remember previous chat history let me give you a reason why so for example let's say i am passing a input to my model over here saying that my name is smith okay that's the input that i have given let's say the model gives a output to me is that okay good to know 
now let's say i'm giving a input to the model again asking it that what is my name now this input that i have passed can only be correctly answered only if the model remembers the previous message in the chat history okay so previous messages in the chat history okay so if the model remembers previous messages in the chat history then it will be beneficial in this scenario so many a times it's useful that your models do have the extra capability of remembering previous chat history okay uh, so previously the models that were built by open ai company did not remember previous chat history so that was available in this completion section whereas now they have introduced a new section called chat completion the full name actually should be chat completion that that is the name mentioned in the documentation as well full name is chat completion so in chat completion you get access to models that remember previous chat history in the below section you get access to models that do not remember previous chat history okay so the all the latest models of open ai do remember previous chat history okay so you can work with it then you have a section called dali dali is here in this section you will be able to work with models that do image generation okay that do image generation so if you ask it to create image of a uh, of let's say um eiffel tower it will create an image of eiffel tower for you if you ask it to create an image of a elephant riding a bicycle it will create that image of a elephant riding a bicycle and so on okay like that there are different sections you will see it but fine my main difference that i wanted to communicate to you was the chat completion section and the just completion section so guys what is the difference in the chat completion section versus the below section what is the difference can anybody mention the difference over here what is the difference between chat completion and just completion so pradeep says in chat completion you get access to models that remember previous chat history whereas in just completion section you get access to models that do not remember previous chat history okay so previously all the models that were created by open ai company they did not remember previous chat history but now they are new models do remember previous chat history okay so let me go to chat completion section i guess there's some internet issue from end that's why loading is slow and uh, before i go ahead over here uh, one student has a doubt prabhat says from security point of view is resource key is compromised what additional uh, uh, ways we can use to avoid uh, any security issue from occurring okay so let's see that first so there are many many ways uh, let me show you that so one is key based authentication the one that you are already seeing we have different ways of doing authentication over here let me show you those okay so one is key based authentication in key based authentication what happens is let's say i'm working in my coding file and that coding file is inside of a vm of cloud okay vm by vm i mean virtual machine okay you can think of virtual machine as a server on cloud so let's say on i'm on some server of cloud i have uploaded a coding file okay and what that coding file wants to do that coding file wants to access the data instead of a separate service called azure sql database service so i have some data over there and my coding file wants to access that data in a separate service so one authentication approach that i we could follow is key based authentication wherein we can take the key of our end resource in in this scenario my end resource is sql database resource i can take the key of it and that key i can paste it in my coding file but the uh, this advantage of this is if anybody has access to my coding file they will be easily able to see the key if they easily are able to see the key then they will be easily able to use my end resource just like you guys were able to do right when i gave you my coding file in my coding file you were able to see the key if you are able to see the key then using the key you are able to use the resource that i created right 
so this is not a good way of doing authentication so then we went one step ahead okay so let's see what were what all the uh, different approaches that were invented so in order to avoid key based authentication what people thought was that okay the issue is that coding file should not contain the key right so let's have a separate service called key vault service this key vault service job is to store the key the key vault services job is to store the key okay so we we'll store our key inside of key vault service but for my coding file to use the key inside of key vault i will have to do authentication to key vault right so that means some configuration of key vault i will have to mention in my coding file so again there is a big danger if anybody has access to my coding file they will be able to see the configuration of key vault if they see configuration of key vault they will be able to go inside of key vault if they are able to go inside of key vault they will be able to see the key stored inside of it and if they are able to see the key then using that key they can get access to our end resource over here so again not a full proof way so we saw key based authentication then we saw key vault based authentication now let's see the third approach for authentication which is much better and it's called managed identity approach so there are two type of managed identities one is system assigned and another is user assigned okay so what is the difference between the two so let's understand it so in order to understand it i will need help, help of one student over here let me take help of pradeep so pradeep currently i am showing you the third approach for authentication first was key based second was key vault based and third is managed identity based so in this third approach of managed identity there are two types one is system assigned managed identity second is user assigned managed identity so let's talk about system assigned managed identity first and for understanding it i'll need help of one student so let me take help, help of that student over here and before that currently i can see there is a uh, sorry there is some brightness issue on my monitor let me correct it okay i don't know why brightness is getting reduced automatically fine or i guess there might be some issue in my monitor okay anyways let me proceed so over here prabhat i guess prabhat has a doubt so prabhat i am showing you the third approach for uh, security one is one was key based another was key vault and now i'm showing you the third approach what is that the third approach is managed identity based approach there are two types of managed identity one is system assigned second is user assigned so prabhat let's talk about system assigned managed identity first so prabhat let's suppose you are working in office let's say this is you prabhat and you are working in office now prabhat when you go to the office in order for you to get entry into it do you have to sh show some id card to the security team yes or no prabhat plug the charger is there a acha ha ha okay okay thanks for pointing out i guess there is that issue are but my charger is plugged why still i have that problem my charger is plugged and now charging okay now it says charging okay okay ha ah, now i guess that blinking has stopped okay fine if it's plugged i don't know why the charge is acha i guess it was not properly plugged in maybe okay anyways moving forward so prabhat uh, talking about uh, our third approach of security which is managed identity there are two types system assigned and user assigned so let's talk about system assigned first so let's suppose you are working in a office now for you to get access to office you have to carry a id card now let's say prabhat you are very lazy like me let's say i am lazy and like me you are also lazy that i don't like to carry the id card with me every time what if i forget and so on okay so what i am thinking is why should i carry the id card every time why don't i hire this third party person this job of third party person will be to store id cards and this third party person will always stay near the security gate of my office so what i will do is 
what i will do is i will conduct a one time meeting between the security team of my office and this third party person i will introduce this third party person to the security team of my office saying that see this third party person is very good you do the background check and everything he is very reliable and so on and i will say to my office that now i won't carry the id card with me every time i am giving my id card to this third party person this third party person will have the id card with him so now prabhat whenever you go to the office you don't have to carry the id card with you your id card was given to this third party person this third party person's job is to store the id card and he will always stay near, stay near the security gate of the office and whenever he sees you coming he will see that okay prabhat is coming so he will pull out your id card and show your id card to the security team so prabhat isn't this a better approach that instead of you carrying any secret with you now you don't have to worry about you carrying any you know security related document you are passing that on to a third party person that third party person will store it okay and now the idea is that whenever i want to gain access let's say i want to gain access to my office so instead of me carrying the id card i have given my id card to this third party person and whenever this third party person sees me coming that third party person will just show the id card uh, of me to the office and i'll gain access to my office it's just that this one time meeting has to happen between my security team and this third party person that i am hiring same concept is used in this a managed identity concept called system assigned managed identity in system assigned managed identity what you do is let's say you have a coding file and you want to access the data inside of sql database but instead of you showing the id card to the security team every time what you are doing you are storing your id card in a third party service this third party service is called azure active directory it was special specially made only for this purpose to store the id cards okay now this service has been renamed to microsoft entra previously it was known as microsoft active directory sorry azure active directory now it has been renamed to microsoft entra so whatever name you call it it's the same thing uh, its job will be to store the id card so now what you are doing for the coding file to get access to azure sql database coding file will not give any credentials to azure sql database that okay see the credentials now give me access no coding file has given the credentials to this third party service azure active directory and whenever my coding file wants to access this end resource uh, this end resource will check uh, in this third party service that okay does my coding file have the necessary id or not and it will see the necessary id and looking at that it will give uh, give me give the access to the coding file so just like prabhat you if you wanted to get access to office what did you say that okay instead of you carrying the id card with you every time you are hiring this third party person this third party person will always stay near the security gate of the office and what you are doing you are handling the id card to this third party person is just that one time meeting you will have to do between the security team and this third party person that okay get to know each other better so that you can trust each other and so on okay and then you will say to your security team of your office that hence for i won't carry my credentials with me i won't carry the id card with me my id card will be given to this third party person so whenever you see me coming and you want to see whether i have access or not don't dare to ask me for showing my credentials ask this third party person he will show you the credentials just check from this third party person itself okay so just like that the same concept is used so prabhat isn't this approach better because now in this approach you don't have to carry the credentials with you every time right so this is the approach in system assigned managed identity so prabhat there was a second type of managed identity what was that there was a second type as well so one was system assigned which we just saw another is user assigned second type guys is user assigned okay so first type is system assigned second type is user assigned what is the difference between system assigned and user assigned so guys in system assigned managed identity the drawback was uh, so prabhat let answer this question buddy let's suppose uh, looking at you people have found out that okay you are not carrying the id card with you every time 
you are hiring this third party person to store the id card so now from now on this third party person will store the id card okay fine so let's say prabhat like you all the members in your team also try to follow the same process so let's say now four people in your team total four people in your team have taken help of this third party person to store their id cards so now this third party person will have to store how many id cards prabhat this third party person will have to store how many id cards if four people are going to take help of this third party person then this third party person will have to store four id cards right and so on which could be tedious for this third party person okay so similarly let's have my four uh, vms um, in order to uh, store their credentials i'll have to store four separate credentials one credential for one vm second credential for second vm third credential for third vm and so on so in system assign manage identity what happens is for every entity we store a different id card but instead of that why don't we do this what if let's say um, multiple entities are going to need same access let's say for example prabhat uh, you and your teammates have the same designation okay so i gave that explanation to you earlier that you are four people in your team okay and now let's say you guys have the same uh, designation same everything same access you need so why should this third party person store four separate id cards for four different people why don't we combine these four different id cards into one id card that will be shared by the entire team okay so here now multiple entities will share the same id card so if person 1 comes then also same id card will be shown if person 2 comes then also same id card will be shown and so on ha in that id card details of everyone will be mentioned okay uh, so because it's a id card of a group so details of every entity in that group will be mentioned but it will be one single id card only so this is the concept used in user assigned manage identity so in system assign manage identity for every entity you have to store a different id card whereas in user assign manage identity you can um, uh, group the id cards into one so if you feel that okay these entities are going to need same access so why to have separate id cards for them why don't we have share one single id card among them okay so this concept of sharing the id card among multiple entities is called user assign manage identity okay so prabhat you are talking about different ways in which you could improve security up till now we only implemented key based security approach apart from key based there was key vault based security approach uh, then the third security approach that i showed you was manage identity based security approach okay so i showed you these three different security approaches these are the three ones that you need to know for now okay did did they make sense prabhat yes okay fine mayo says explain about token per limit yes yeah, so what happens behind the scene okay for that uh, pradeep uh, sorry uh, what is your name ha mayur so for that mayur uh, you will need to understand how a custom model is made because when a custom model is made how it will go through the data on which it was trained and all of that but for now just remember this one sentence that that token per limit field that you saw all it was showing you was that okay see if you are asking a model a question that okay give me answer to this question what it will do it must be trained on some data right so whatever data it is trained on it will try to uh, process that data just like if I, if i ask you a question what do you do in your brain you have some data on which you are trained and you try to process that data right same thing happens in this scenario so the model is trained on some data and whenever we ask it to give a an answer what it does it process processes that data so that data it will break it down into tokens so we are just setting a limit that okay per limit uh, per minute how many uh, tokens it should process and so on. um the full understanding you will only get when we'll cover working of custom models when i will show you how custom models are created um in our upcoming webinar i guess we have it scheduled in the pipeline 
so probably there you will fully understand that concept okay um, because unless and until we see how custom model is built you will not understand why that rate limit would be important and so on so now just understand that is done for cost purposes okay but if you minimize that cost purpose there could be um issues in the performance as well and so on but fine for now just remember that uh, you set a lower limit for cost purposes that per minute only set these may only process these many tokens so that you are minimizing the cost but if you process only few tokens in your uh, data then with that it's not necessary that the answer that you get out of it is always good so yes if you if the rate limit that you have set is too low maybe because of that the output that the model generates is not good okay so it's like if i'm limiting your performance that okay in your brain now um, if i ask you a question then what you do you go in your brain and try to process on the data that you are trained on okay but if i limit the functioning of your brain that okay your brain should only process this much thing uh, you should only pro use this much capacity of your brain yes with that you will uh, reduce your energy and so on that is good part but the disadvantage is that if i limit the functioning of your brain maybe the answer that i get out of out of, out of your brain is not that accurate okay so it's a double edged sword but you will fully understand only if we cover that concept of custom model okay so just remember that that rate limit is used to decrease the number of tokens to process that that will be processed behind the scenes in a minute but if the limit is too low uh the answer that the model might give might not be too good okay because the model will have to output a answer in a particular period of time okay so all right uh let's go ahead and let's see more stuff about this over here so guys we were talking about our uh, model we wanted to use a model so we first made it live that means we first deployed it okay now what i want to do is i want to use it so how to use it i'll go to this section and, uh, uh, on the left hand side it's called chat completion the full name should have been chat completion here you get access to models that do remember previous chat history so this model that we deployed was gpt40 it does remember previous chat history whereas in the below section you will get access to models that do not remember previous chat history okay and i had give you a new example that why remembering previous chat history is important okay so let me go to the about section called chat completion here you will get access to models that do remember previous chat history here you see three subsections okay here you see three subsections one is setup se subsection in between you have the chat subsection okay the first one is called setup in between you have chat and on the right hand side you have information about various parameters okay or i should say model settings okay i will explain each field one by one don't worry about it so let me talk about the middle section which is the chat section so just like how you work with chat gpt tool you ask it some question and you get a answer back is the same thing over here you ask it a question saying um uh, who is tom cruise it will give you answer over that okay tom cruise is an actor and so on now i i will ask it uh, how old is he how old is he now in this scenario in order to answer this question okay i'm passing an input called how old is he uh, the model will only be able to understand it properly only if it remembers previous chat history over here and currently our model that we deployed was gpt4 o model that does remember previous chat history okay so fine now it will remember from previous chat history that okay we are talking about tom cruise so if at all a user is asking a question like how old is he probably that user is asking about tom cruise so it will give me the age of tom cruise over here okay and it says that tom cruise is 61 years old and so on okay so here you can chat or you can ask it any question so just same questions that you could pass to chat gpt to same you can pass it over here okay important point that i wanted to communicate was about the uh, performance of every model 
see this gpt4 o model has a, a limit of 128000 tokens 128000 tokens okay that it can remember per session this is per session now what is this session i will explain that to you don't worry okay let me explain it um, uh, i will explain each and every setting that is present over here but i hope the middle section is clear to you it's the chat section here you can normally go ahead and chat with your model you can pass it to input and based on that to give you output okay now let me explain the other parts that you see on your screen so chat section i have explained let me move on to the section on the left which is setup section so guys in the setup section you can uh, give directions to the model as to how it should behave so here there is a field called system message and here in system message what i can do is i can pass a direction as to how i want my model to behave so what i want to do is uh, i want my model to give me the sentiment of the input that i have passed so i will give a answer that give me the sentiment of the input because if i don't do that it will not understand it properly so for example if i am giving a input saying this product is bad now here the input that i am passing carries a negative sentiment but in my output it will not give me an answer that okay negative the sentiment of the input is negative no it gives me some random output over here okay uh, but what i want to do is i want it to give a uh i want it to give me a sentiment saying that okay this is the sentiment that we have uh um uh, found from the input and uh, this is your sentiment and so on so for example if i pass it that uh, uh i like this very much so this input has a positive sentiment okay but on its own you can see it does not tell me that okay sentiment is positive okay so what i want is i want this uh, uh, i want to give a direction to the model so i'll go to system message and i'll pass a direction i will say give the sentiment of the user's input okay fine so i have given it a direction now let me go ahead and let me apply these changes over here so now a new session will start okay and now let me ask the same exact uh, let me pass the same exact input that i passed earlier hopefully now it understands that i want the sentiment of the user's input and it gives me a sentiment saying that okay currently the sentiment is positive and it does say that okay sentiment is positive similarly if i ask it if i pass it this particular input hopefully my model understands that sentiment is negative and you can see it says sentiment is negative but let's suppose i want to customize it more what i want to do is let's say i am part of zomato team and what i want to do is i am introducing a new feature wherein based on the user's comment we will be assigning a score to the restaurant that if there is a positive comment assign a score of plus 1 if there is a negative comment assign a score of minus 1 if there is a comment having mixed emotions assign a score of 0 some let's say something like that i want to do but if i want to communicate this full story uh if you feel that okay you will not be able to communicate the full story with help of system message then what you can do is you can go ahead and pass examples to the model that okay model this is how i want you to behave so below there is a option called add examples here you can go ahead and pass examples to the model and uh let the model know that okay model this is how i want you to be here so you can see two new fields pop up one is user message this is where you will pass the input of your example this is where you will pass the input of your example below that you have assistant message this is where you pass the output of your example okay so i want to give a example to the model that okay if a person asks something like this is a very good product in that scenario yes you want to give the sentiment of the user but don't give the sentiment in the form of words give it using a score so if there is a positive sentiment give a score of plus 1 similarly let me add more examples i'll add a second example over here i will pass a input to 
uh, i'll pass a input over here in my example saying that if somebody asks that okay this product is bad in that scenario yes the user wants you to give the sentiment but do not give the entire sentiment in the form of words instead give us score to it give a numerical score so in case of negative sentiment give a numeric score of minus 1 similarly let me add one more example let me add a mixed review i will say that this product was okay however it could have been better however it could have been better so here what i am doing i am assigning a example for a mixed review that okay in case of mixed review assign a score of 0 and currently what i am doing is i am passing three examples here i pass one example below that here i pass second example and even below the second example i pass the third example it's not necessary that just by three examples your model will understand your full story okay but let's see if the model does it or not uh, so over here what i will do is uh, i will apply these changes and now hopefully the model understands that whenever i want it to give me the sentiment of the input uh, i do not want it in a text manner i want it uh, to be score based so for positive review give me a score of plus 1 for negative review give me a score of minus 1 for mixed review give me a score of 0 okay so let's see if it does that or not so now i will pass it the input let me pass the above input saying i like this very much so this is a a uh, input of positive sentiment in that case i wanted a score of plus 1 let's see if the model has understood that or not and you can see it has understood that similarly let me pass it a positive input again i will say this product was excellent okay or i will say i will recommend this product to everyone i will recommend this product to all my friends so currently in my input i have a, a text of positive sentiment in case of positive sentiment i want to assign a score of plus 1 let's see if it does that it and does that over here let me pass it a negative review so i will say that this buying this product was a mistake buying this product was a big mistake okay so this is a negative review in that scenario i want a score of minus 1 let's see if it does that and you can see it does that over here okay so the point that i tried to make was that in system message you give direction to the model that okay this is how you want the model to behave but let's say if the full story you are not able to communicate just through system message then you can go ahead and give examples to the model and through examples also you can make the model learn okay it's not necessary to always give examples sometimes with system message itself you can communicate the full story but if you feel that okay your story is complex the task that you want your model to do is complex you will not be able to communicate it in just words it's better to give examples so you can go ahead and give examples over here to the model just like if i'm training you and if i feel that okay just by words i'll not be able to communicate the full picture then what i do i give a certain examples in the same manner to this model also you can give examples okay so there are three type of fields one is system message another is user message and third is assistant message these are the three main type of fields so system message contains the main direction for the model user message and assistant message are used to add example are used to add examples user message is used to part, pass the input for your example and assistant message is used to pass the output for your example and assistant message is used to pass the output for your example okay fine similarly guys above there are templates given that okay if you don't want to pass system message yourself if you don't want to pass user message yourself if you don't want to pass assistant message yourself then there are certain templates of messages available for example if you want your model to behave like a irs chatbot sorry irs uh, tax chatbot then you can go ahead and select that option with that you will get a predefined system message present predefined user message present predefined assistant message present 
Okay, so you can use those templates with that. You will get those predefined messages. Okay, if you don't want any predefined messages, use this option called empty example. Okay, fine. All right, now that you have saved the changes, a new chat session will start. And you can see currently your tokens has been set to zero. Okay, so for example, if you ask it, let me clear it so that you don't see the above stuff. Although if it's there, it's not a big issue, but to not confuse you, let me clear the above stuff. Okay, now let me ask it something like, how are you? So you can see this input, it will break it down into three tokens most probably. Uh, is it not showing me the token count live? Uh, let me refresh this. Let me ask it something like how. Okay. Your, I guess due to some connectivity issue, it is not showing me the token count live. Otherwise, it would update the token count. Even if I don't execute, so it would update the token count over here. But I guess there might be some connectivity issue. Okay, because of which it is not uh, updating the token count. Fine. So I guess I'll have to pass the input, then it will update, not a worry. Uh, so let me pass it over here. So I pass uh, input, it will break it down into tokens. How would be one token, R would be another token, U would be another token and so on. Okay, similarly, if I pass something like uh, my name is Smith, this, it will break it down into tokens and so on. So what happens is your input is broken down into tokens. And while creating your output, your output also is previously in the form of tokens only. And collectively, you see the entire count that okay in your current chat session. Yes, our model remembers previous chat history, but what does it remember? It remembers the tokens of the previous messages. So here you can see it has remembered those 26 tokens. Okay, it has remembered those 26 tokens. Fine. Then you can also mention that okay, apart from these 26 tokens. Um, you can also set a limit that, okay, how many messages do you want to remember? So for example, here currently we have passed one message. So one input and output will be treated as one message. Similarly, if you pass, if you get another input and output that will be treated as second message and so on. So you want to remember uh, tokens of how many messages. Okay, fine. So you can even set that message limit. Apart from that, uh, this model has a limit of remembering 1,28,000 tokens. So currently only 26 have been utilized. As and guys, this is, sorry, I got disconnected in the middle. Very helpful. Okay, why it's helpful? Let So to give me some response base. Once I guess there's some issue, yes. Because of which I am not able to uh, get the answer. Otherwise, the uh, I, I I would see the live count over here of tokens. There's some internet connectivity connectivity issue. Let me change it. All right, so I've changed my, uh, hopefully now it works well. All right, is now my voice clear, Prabhat? Is now, is my voice clear now? Yes, okay. Fine, so I wanted to show you about token count that, okay, you're in a session, it remembers previous messages, but what it does is it, broke the, it breaks down those messages into tokens. Okay, so that's how it remembers it. So it does remember previous status yes, but it breaks it down into tokens. And this model has a capacity of remembering 1,28,000 tokens in a session. And in a session, how many messages you will remember that you can set, whether 10 messages, 11 messages, 12 messages, whatever. Okay, fine. So this is uh, to remember previous status 
okay so for example if you say that my name is smith shah it will give you some output okay and now let me ask it what is my name what is my name and it should say that okay my name is smith shah okay so it's important to remember previous chat history because if it didn't remember previous chat history how would it know my name right all right so it is important to remember previous chat history so currently these settings that you see over here is for that that okay in previous chat history currently uh, this model has capability of storing 1028 tokens out of which how many have been utilized okay and so on let's say our model has capability of only remembering 20 tokens out of it, let's say 16 are utilized. And let's say you entered a text of, uh, let's say, five tokens. What is my name? Let me put question mark as well so that there's five tokens total. Okay, so now if I try to remember this as well, it will be 21 tokens, which I can't store in this model because the limit is 20 tokens. So what will happen from the above messages? Okay, some tokens will be removed and uh, then the uh, new space uh, will be used for storing the tokens of your uh, new message and so on. Okay, so these fields are uh, used to mention about that chat history. That okay, how much part of chat history do you want to remember? All right, now uh, above that, you have an option to choose which deployed model you want to use. So let's say you have deployed many models, but you only want to interact with one. You can choose which one you want to interact with. Okay. Fine. Uh, so up till here, guys, making sense? Up till here, these settings, are they making sense? Okay. So no says how uh, we restrict AI chatbot to use our custom data only not use any other data source okay so you can train your uh, uh, chat uh, you can train your open ai model to work on your own custom data let me show you an example okay since you asked about it let me show you an example so for example let me let me show you my custom data first let me take some pdf files Let me take some PDF files over here. Uh, custom, right? Uh, okay, I guess it will be available in this folder. Void brochures, huh? This is the one. So let's have my custom data over here. So let's suppose, buddy, I run a travel agency called Margie's Travel. And what I want to do is you can see I have, uh, we have made brochures for different, different places. And in each brochure, we have mentioned information about where to stay and so on. For example, if anybody wants to stay in New York, we have created a brochure that, okay, for New York, stay in Manhattan Hotel, you can stay in Grand Central Hotel, Park Hotel and so on. Okay, so this is my custom data. I want to try, I want to pass this custom data to my model, then how to do that. Okay, let's see. So currently I have not passed my custom data. So if I ask it, where to stay in new york where to stay in new york it will give me some random answer over here based on its own data on which it was trained okay and you can see it has given me some random answer but what i want to do is i want to pass my own custom data how to do it let's see so what we'll do is we'll pass our own custom data and whatever data we'll pass that data will be broken down by the open AI model into different chunks. Okay, so into different chunks, into different pieces of data. Okay, so it will be broken down into different chunks for better organization purposes. Now, let's say I'm asking the model for some information. Let's say that information is present in chunk two itself. So if it's present in chunk two itself, would I want my open AI model to go through all the chunks unnecessarily? What do you think, Sonu? 
currently you are, you have let's say you have passed some data to the open ai model i will show you how to do that but whenever you will pass your data to the open ai model that open ai model will break it down will break your data into small small parts called chunks okay now the question that i am asking to you sonu is let's say you ask the model a uh, let's say you pass the input to the model now let's say the output can be obtained just by going through chunk 2 of the data so if the output can be obtained only by going through chunk 2 of the data is it necessary for the model to go through all the chunks would you want your model to go through all the chunks of data no right why to honestly let the model go through all the chunks so what we want to do is fine we will pass our data that data will be divided into chunks but in order to get the information we only want our we want our model only to go into the relevant chunk so this concept of retrieving the relevant chunk and generating the response is known as raj retrieving the relevant chunk and generating the response is known as raj retrieval augmented generation wherein yes you are passing your data to the open ai model your open ai model will divide it into small small parts but let's say now you are asking a in, you are giving a input to the model now to uh, get the output your model will not go through all the chunks of data it will only go into the relevant chunk from which the output could be generated so retrieving the relevant chunk of data and then generating the response is known as rag okay so let me show you how to do that sonu since you asked so in the setup section can you see there is a option called add your data so i'll click on that and i will say add a data source i'll select my data source here i have my data source in the uh, form of files behind the scenes what it will do is those files it will try to upload in a separate service called storage account service also known as blob storage account service some people call it just storage account service one and the same thing so storage account service is a separate service in azure whose only purpose is to store data you can think of it as a alternative to google drive just like google drive is used to store any type of data right even storage account can store any type of data so behind the scenes whatever files will upload it will be stored in a storage in a resource of storage account service so here it's asking that okay in which resource should it store so currently i have not created a resource of storage account service let me create it so i'll click on create a resource button option and it will redirect me to a page where i will create a resource of storage account service so behind the scenes whatever custom data i am passing it will be stored behind the scenes in this separate service called storage account service so i'll just fill all the details over here let me give a name to my storage account resource okay i'll select the region then performance level standard or premium uh with premium uh, what happens is uh, your latency is low that means your read and write is done much faster whereas with standard tier your perform your latency is slightly high that means read and write will be done sl slightly slower okay uh, however advantage of standard tier is that it costs very less whereas premium tier will cost you slightly more okay so let me choose standard tier for lesser cost yes the latency will be slightly high but that's okay for me uh, then redundancy so it says that okay if due to traffic issues this storage account resource is not accessible to you then what will happen so what azure does over here is that it creates a copy of the resource so with geo redundant storage let's say my main resource was created in west us then the copy of it then the copy of it will be stored somewhere outside of west us let's say somewhere like india so even if all the servers of west us get destroyed no worries your copy of the resource was made was stored in india and you will be able to use your copy of the resource uh, without any issue okay so in case of non availability of the main resource uh, you will be able to use your copy resource okay and behind the scenes all the work that is done on the main resource azure will do the same work on the copy resource as well so let's say you uploaded one file on your storage account resource the same file will be uploaded on your copy resource behind the scenes is that copy resource 
won't be accessible to you directly. Okay, it will only be available in case of non availability of your main resource. Only then access will be redirected to this copy resource. And it won't matter to you whether you're working with the main resource or the copy one, as long as you're doing, you are able to do the same work. So this is what happens in geo redundant storage, wherein you are storing the copy in a separate geo location altogether. Uh, then you have another option called locally redundant storage. So in locally redundant storage, what happens is let's say we have a main resource somewhere in West US. Then three copies will be made of it. Three copies will be made. But all those copies will be stored within the same region only. So the disadvantage is that what, what if the entire West US region gets destroyed due to a natural calamity with that your main resource goes and your copy resources also go. This is the disadvantage. The advantage is that cost is very, very low. Okay, with geo redundant storage cost is high, but with locally redundant storage cost is low. Okay, fine. All the other settings like networking settings and everything, I'll keep it default. Let me directly create a resource of storage account service. Okay, since you just want to see the working uh, since so no, I won't just want to complete your task. The in between options I'm not showing to you because the main task that I want to show you is how to pass your custom data to the open AI model. Currently, I've not done any of that over here. Okay, let's just wait for our storage account resource to get created. So what I was doing, I was going to upload files to my open AI model, but those files that I upload behind the scenes, it will be stored in a separate resource called storage account resource. So I first created that storage account resource and that is the one that I will select uh, in this drop down that, okay, these files that I'm uploading, the files that I'll be sending to my open AI model, behind the scenes, you can store it in a resource called storage account resource. Okay, fine. Now that our resource has been created, let me select it. Uh, and you can see, I can, you can see your uh, newly created storage account resource called webinar storage res. Okay, let me turn CORS. It means that, okay, uh, currently your open AI resource wants to communicate with storage account resource. So you are doing cross resource communication. So let's, let's turn on cross resource communication. Okay, after that, what you want to do is, um, here what it will do is, in order to search for the relevant chunk of data, see, I will pass my data. That data will be divided into chunks. That data will be divided into chunks, right? Now, in order to get the relevant chunk of data, now, there are two ways you can do the search. One is normal uh, keyword based search. Okay, keyword based search is like doing normal control F. Okay, wherein you can see that, okay, in your input, you have this token. This token is present in which chunk. So you can do a normal control F. So that is how keyword based search you can do. So there are two types of searches. One is keyword based search, which is like doing normal control F. Another is semantic search. So in Google, if you do, if you go to google.com, if you go to google.com and if you ask it, let's say revenue of Apple, if you ask it revenue of Apple, it understands that I'm talking about Apple company. On the other hand, if I go to google.com again, and if I ask it calories in Apple, it understands that here I'm talking about Apple as a fruit. So what is happening? Which type of search is implemented over here? A search wherein the context of the token is also stored. This is known as semantic search. Okay, without diving into the uh, technicalities of semantic search, just remember that in semantic search, context of the uh, uh, token is stored. And how do we do it? So basically, every token will be assigned a set of numbers. Okay, that for example, every token let's say apple so it will be assigned a set of numbers that is it related to company so i'll say yes then is it related to fruit so currently in this token no here i'm not talking about fruit so i'll answer zero then and so on like this there will be different different fields for every field a value will be given 
and collectively those combination of numeric values is called a vector so how semantic search works is for every token a vector is generated okay and in that vector you are having some numeric values and those new with those numeric values we try to uh, figure out the context behind the token okay and so on okay without going to the technicalities this, uh, this is how it works in semantic search so there are two type of searches semantic search keyword search in order to do that search we have a separate uh, service called search service so let me create a resource of that it will help me to do that key keyword search and semantic search that i want okay so let me do that over here i'll create a resource of search service All right, let me fill in the details over here. And let me create a resource. In fact, let me choose. Uh, let me create a name, assign a name called webinar. Search RES. OK, then the location, let me select any location over here. Pricing tier, uh, let me select basic one. So that I have lesser cost. OK, uh, here you will see each tier has different capabilities of performing search and so on. Without going into the capabilities, let me just select a tier. OK, because my main intention is to show you how to pass your own data over here, not to work with these services. OK, let me create a resource of the search service. All right, and we'll wait for around one or two minutes for a search for a resource of search service to get created. And then we'll see what to do next. Let's wait for one or two minutes. Our resource creation is in progress. Once our resource is created, we'll see what to do next. OK, it has been created. Now let me go over here and let me select the resource that I'll be using for my search, whether it will be a keyword based search or a semantic search. Obviously, semantic search is better. You know, search service, what it does, I had explained in the morning that it organizes the data in the form of indexes. So you can assign the date index a name. Index helps for better, uh, faster searching of data. You can assign that index a name over here. I'll call it test index. Let me click on next. Then let me upload the files that I want to pass to my OpenAI model. And uh, these are the files that I want to pass. Let me upload them. Click on next. It is asking me for search type keyword or semantic. I explained the search types for you. Obviously, semantic is better because it remembers the context behind the uh, token. Then it is asking that, OK, the data that I'll pass will be divided into chunks. So what will, what should be the chunk size? So currently I'm saying that, OK, a chunk should have maximum 1224 tokens in it and so on. Similarly, you can change the chunk size if you want to. Let me click on next. Then which is the data connection that I will use? So which security? So I guess I explained the security concept uh, to Prabhat, if I'm not wrong. And at that time, I explained those concept of key, key-based security, key vault based security, manage identity-based security. OK, it's just that if I use manage identity-based security, one at least one time meeting has to be done between my current resource and the end resource to which it wants to communicate. Currently, I have not done any one time meeting. That's why if I select the manage identity option, it will lead to an error. Because that one time meeting has not been done. You can see it leads to an error. So let me use normal key based uh, uh, security setting only. So I'll use key based security approach. OK, after that, let me move to the next page. And let me save my data, the one that I have passed. All right, so my data is passed. And previously, you see, when I asked it where to stay in New York, it gave me some random answer over here. Have a look in the uh, in the middle section. Some random answer is given. But now I have passed my data. In my data, I had uploaded a brochure for New York. And for New York, I had specifically suggested these three hotels. So now if I ask it a question saying where to stay in New York, if I ask it the same question, where to stay in New York, it will give me an answer based on these three hotels. 
because now I have it. Sorry, my connection got dropped in the middle. What I was saying was, uh, let us just wait for our uh, custom data to fully get ingested, and then we'll see what to do next. So with this, Sonu's doubt will also be clear. That okay, how you can pass your custom data to the model? Okay, and now your uh, now whatever question you ask, it will first go to your custom data, and from there it will try to give you the answer. Okay, so let us just wait over here. We'll just wait for around two to three minutes for our custom data to fully get ingested. And after that, we'll move forward and we'll see the other stuff. Okay, till then, I would urge all of you guys to please fill the feedback form. It's mentioned by Archie in the chat section. Please fill the feedback form and you can mention the feedback of our current webinar. Okay. Fine. We were waiting for our data to get ingested. That ingestion has been done. Now let me ask it where to stay in New York. Now it will give me an answer based on my custom data. In my custom data, I'd pass these three hotels, Manhattan Hotel, Grand Central Hotel, Park Hotel. And it gives me exactly those three hotels, Manhattan Hotel, Grand Central Hotel, Park Hotel. So you can see now it has given me information from my own custom data over here. Okay, you can see it has given me that information from my own custom data, the one that I had passed. Okay, so with this, Sonu Kumar's doubt is also done. Sonu Kumar wanted to learn how to pass own custom data, and we have learned about it. Remember, your Sonu Kumar, you are not training the model. Is this that you are passing extra data? Okay, and the model just say uh, just finds out that okay, um, your input that you have passed. Uh, in order to get output for it, which will be the relevant chunk of data from which it, from which it can extract information. Okay, so it's, it is only doing that extraction of information work. Um, so remember, this is technically not retraining the model. You are not retraining the model over here. It's just that to the already trained model, you are passing your data. And uh, whenever you give any input to your model now, your model will just check, okay, that in your data that you have passed, which is the chunk of uh, data that has the relevant information for your input. And in that chunk of data, it will just extract that from that chunk of data, it will extract that information and show to you. Okay, fine. So Sonu Kumar, this was your doubt, right? Passing custom data. Yes, if not, let me know. This is how you can pass your custom data. If you had any other doubt, let me know. OK, fine. Till then, let's move forward. Uh, so now, guys, uh, what I want to do is I want to uh, show you how to interact with this resource with code. OK, so if you want to interact with this resource with code, then let me show you that approach as well. OK, so what to do? Uh, currently, I've shown you how to interact with the resource without code. Guys, is the without code approach clear to everyone? Without code approach clear to everyone? Yes or no? Is it clear, guys? Mayur has raised this hand. Yes, Mayur, if you have some doubt, let me know. Guys, is the without code approach clear? Yes, okay. Huh. Right. So Prabhat, this approach that we just saw wherein we passed our own data, uh, it's called RAG concept. Okay. Here we didn't go into the technicalities. We just executed it, but it's RAG concept over here. Retrieval augmented generation, wherein you pass your own data, the divided, the data will be divided into chunks. And whenever you give an input to the model, uh, the model will find the relevant chunk of your data. And from that chunk, it will extract the information and give to you. So retrieving the relevant chunk and generating the response is known as RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Okay, so retrieving the relevant chunk and generating the response is known as RAG. Okay, fine. Now, uh, you should see one particular thing that I have not explained in, in on your screen. 
do you find that what is that thing that i have not explained over here from your screen itself it's about parameters guys so on the right hand side you see parameters so i have not explained these parameters to you let me explain to you okay so above you have a field called max response uh, which tells you that per output maximum how many tokens should be there okay per output maximum how many tokens should be there you can increase or decrease it okay uh, then you have other uh, fields over here let me explain to you each field one by one in fact let me start from the end okay let me start from the end let me talk about okay or fine even if i start from the uh, above one it, it won't matter as such the thing is explanation of temperature i want to give 5 minutes back a uh, 5 minutes later after showing you explanation of all the other fields because then explanation of temperature parameter will make sense okay so temperature parameter remember is used to give varied responses a higher temperature value will lead to more varied responses a lower temperature value will might give you the same words in the response again and again so see sometimes what you might want is uh, let's say you are asking it a question saying how are you okay it has given you answer now again if you ask it how are you you don't want the same response again and again okay then it will become very boring for you that again you are asking how are you it again says that okay i am doing well how can i assist you it will become very boring right so it's better to have varied responses that in the next response uh, maybe a synonym of a word is used so instead of saying well it says excellent something like that some synonym is used and so on so temperature parameter does that it makes sure that it leads to more varied responses how it does it i will explain that in detail working to you don't worry just after five ten minutes i'll show you is just that first i want to explain the working of the other fields okay uh, now coming to your uh, another parameter called top p okay so what is top p parameter all about let me go ahead and let me show you the working of top p parameter so i'll open a white board and through that white board i will explain the working of top p parameter over here and now let me give a heading of top p so how does top p parameter works so what top p does okay again its main intention is to have more varied responses okay to have a variety slight variety in the response because if you are getting the same response again and again it will become very boring for you okay so let's talk about top p so what it does over here is that it uh controls the randomness of the output by only considering it only considers the top p percent the top p percent most likely next tokens most likely next tokens um based on their probability distribution based on they are probability distribution okay so let's see how it works over here so for example let's suppose a response is generated and up till now in the response i have got a uh, a response saying that the cat sat on the dash okay now this last word last token we want to figure out so what internally uh, this model would do the model that is created by open ai what it will do internally is for every possible token it will generate a probability value so for example for a token like mat it will generate a probability value called 0.30 so for every possible token it will generate a probability value so for mat it will generate a probability of 0.30 for rug it will generate a probability of 0.25 for window cell it will generate a probability of 0.15 for car it will generate a probability of 
for dog it will generate a probability of 0.04 for lawn it will generate a probability of 0.05 and so on it will generate probabilities like this till uh, and it will generate probabilities in such a way that sum of all the probability of tokens sums to one okay uh, it will generate it in such a way that sum of the probabilities of all the tokens will sum up to one okay fine uh, now let's move forward like that it will generate probabilities for the other words over here now normally what would do what you would do that okay you want to find which token will be present over here so you will take the token that has the highest probability and put it at that particular position but every time let's say if you follow this process then every time the token having the highest probability is given to you then what will happen over here is that every time the same word will be used again and again okay which will be very boring to see that okay if our user passes the same input the model is giving the same exact output again and again word by word so you want to have varied a variety of words present so to introduce that what does top p do let's see it says it only considers top p percent most likely next tokens based on their probability distribution so let's say i'm assigning a top p value of 0 0.6 okay 0 0.6 so let's see what top p value equal to 0 0.6 means so what I will do is first I will take the sum of the first of the top six words. Uh, so if I take the sum of probabilities of top six words, their probability comes to around 0 0.9. Is it greater than the top p value that we have set? The top p value that I have set is 0 0.6. Is 0 0.9 greater than 0 0.6? Yes. That's why I cannot take the sum of the top six tokens. Instead, let me take the sum of top five tokens now. Let's see how with that how it is working. So now let me take the sum of the top five tokens. With top six tokens, the probability, the cumulative probability is exceeding the top p value. Fine. So I cannot take the sum of first uh, of top six tokens. Let me take the sum of top five tokens. If I take the sum, the sum comes out to be 0 0.85, which is again greater than the top p value that I have set. So I cannot take the cumulative probability of top five tokens. Let me take the cumulative probability of top four tokens. Here the sum comes out to be 0 0.7. Oh, sorry, no, no, 0 0.8, which is again greater than the top p value that I have set. Okay, which is again greater than the top p value that I have set. So with this again, I cannot take the cumulative probability of top four tokens. Let me take the cumulative probability of top three tokens. Their cumulative probability comes out to be around 0 0.7. Is it greater than the top p value that we have set? Yes. So again, I cannot take probability. I cannot take cumulative probability of top three tokens. Let me take cumulative probability of top two tokens. What is the sum of their cumulative probability? It comes out to be around 0 0.55. Is it greater than top p value that we have set? No, it's not greater. That's why I can take the cumulative probability of top two tokens and my top two tokens are. So now the shortlisted tokens are my top two tokens. First shortlisted token is Matt. Another shortlisted token is Rub. So now whenever a response needs to be done, whenever I want to figure out that in, in this position of my output, what will be the token that will come? So what the model will do is it will first shortlist tokens like this using top P. So using top P, I have shortlisted tokens of Matt and Rug. Now out of the shortlisted tokens, it will select anyone. So maybe in one response, it can select Matt randomly. Maybe in another response, it can select Rug randomly and so on. So here what top P does first, it tries to shortlist tokens out of all the possibilities. Okay, and once the tokens are shortlisted, out of those shortlisted tokens, it can take any one and put it in the output. So maybe one time it can take the word rug and put it in the output. Maybe the next time while generating the res, uh, similar response, it can take the word mat and put it in the output and so on. Okay, so with this, you are making sure that okay, you have variety of words. Maybe sometime the word mat will be used, sometime the word rug will be used and so on. So this is how top P parameter works. Okay, this is how your top P parameter works. What I will do is I'll give a screenshot of this in the chat so that you can understand it.
I'll also share the link to you. Okay, let me share the link. Copy link and paste it in the chat. So this is about top P parameter. Okay, so let me mention it. Sorry. I deleted the link by mistake. Let me mention about top P parameter. Uh, Prabhat, uh, setting the values for the parameters have to be done by using trial and error approach. Okay, there is no way you will find it. I mean, just by looking at the data, you will find the correct value for a parameter. You have to do follow trial and error approach. What I do is I always take a middle value and I see with the middle value how it is performing. If it does not work as per my expectation, then I maybe lower the value or higher the value. So you have to do trial and error. There is no way that is invented currently that can give you the value for a parameter directly. Okay. So you have to follow that trial and error approach. So Lior, let me give a heading to this uh, link that I posted that this is about top P parameter. Okay, fine. Now let me go ahead and let me talk about other stuff like stop sequence. So what does this do? So here you can mention a sequence of tokens uh, and if at all uh, your output generates this sequence of tokens, then at that place itself, stop generating the output. Okay, I repeat myself. What does this uh, stop sequence parameter mean? So guys, stop sequence is a predefined sequence of tokens that tells the model when to stop generating further text. So when the model outputs this sequence, it understands that, okay, now the response should end. So let's say if my stop sequence is something like thank you. So if at all uh, the model encounters this piece of text saying thank you, then at that place itself, it will stop generating further tokens. Okay. So however, in my scenario, I don't want any unnatural stoppage to happen like that. So I'm not assigning any stop sequences. But if you want to do it, you can. Then we have frequency penalty. So what frequency penalty does? Again, the usage of frequency penalty, presence penalty, top P, temperature, all these four parameters are trying to do same exact thing. They are trying to have more varied response. Okay, I've shown you how top P works. Now let me show you how presence penalty works. Okay. So let me show you the entire working over here of presence penalty. So what I will do is I'll go to the home page of my whiteboard, create a new whiteboard. And I'll give a heading over here of frequency penalty. Let me give a heading of frequency penalty. Okay, now let me show you how it works. So what it does, let me mention uh, that over here. I will say it decreases the probability. It decreases the probability of a token being chosen based on how many times, based on how many times it has appeared in the response so far. Okay, fine. So let's see how it works. So there is a full formula to it. Let's see. So the formula is new probability of a token equal to previous probability of a token divided by one plus frequency penalty value into a, a frequency of that token. Let me mention that over here, where uh, in this formula, what do each of the terms mean? where P of T stands for original probability of a token. P of T stands for original probability of a token. FP stands for frequency penalty value. Frequency penalty value that you set. Um, F of T stands for frequency of that token. Okay, so let's see how to apply it. 
So let's say a response has been generated by me. Let's say in that response, three tokens have been generated. Token A, then token B, again token A. Okay, let's suppose these are your three tokens. Okay, I'm not giving any meaningful tokens in the explanation. Let's call them token A, B, C like that. Okay, now in the fourth position, what token will come? Let's suppose for that, uh, the model has calculated probabilities. Okay, so for all the possible tokens, it will calculate probabilities. So at fourth position, uh, probability of token A occurring is 0 0.4. At fourth position, probability of token B occurring is 0 0.35. At fourth position, probability of token C occurring is 0 0.25. Now let's see based on frequency penalty how the probabilities of tokens will be reduced. So let's say I'm setting a frequency penalty value of 0 0.5. Okay, I'm setting a frequency penalty value of 0 0.5. Let me set it over here. Okay, fine. So now new probability of token A equal to previous probability of token A, which is 0 0.4 divided by 1 plus frequency penalty value, which is 0 0.5, the one that I have set, right? Uh, multiplied by F of T. So currently I'm working on token A. Token A has come how many times in the response so far? It has come two times in the response so far. So frequency of that token is two. And with this, if I do the calculation, the calculation comes out to be around 0 0.2. Similarly, let me calculate new probability of token B. Okay, so this is equal to previous probability of token B divided by one plus frequency penalty value multiplied by frequency of that token B. So in uh, up till now in your response, token B has come how many times? One time, so I'll say one. Okay, so with this, you will get a new probability value of 0 0.23. What about token C? Let me calculate new probability of token C. But see, frequency penalty only reduces probability of that token that has appeared in the response so far. If I talk about token C, token C has not appeared in the response so far. So its probability should not be reduced. Let's see if that happens. So now new probability of token C equal to previous probability of token C divided by one plus divided by one plus frequency penalty value multiplied by frequency of that token C. Up till now in my response, token C has not occurred at all. So frequency is zero. So this will be 0 0.25 divided by one, which is 0 0.25 only. So previous probability was also 0 0.25. Current is also 0 0.25. So as expected for token C, the probability didn't change. So what frequency penalty does, if at all a token is has already appeared in the response, then it will try to reduce its probability based on its frequency. Okay, so this is how frequency penalty works. With that, that particular token, see if, if its probability gets reduced, there is lesser chances of it being selected in the response going forward. Okay, so that's how it does it. So let me go ahead and let me rename this. I'll call it webinar frequency penalty. Okay, and I'll share the link to you guys. Let me copy the link and paste it in the chat. And I'll mention it in the chat that this is about frequency penalty. Okay, similarly, there is another parameter over here called presence penalty. So let's see how presence penalty works. Okay. So what presence penalty does is that uh, it reduces the probability of a token, but based on its presence, not its frequency. How it works, let me show that to you. So I'll give a heading over here called presence penalty. And let me show you how that works. So um, let me show you the full working over here and let me mention exactly what it does so yes it reduces probability but how so let me mention it decreases probability decreases probability of tokens that have already appeared 
in the generated response. In the generated response, regardless of the frequency, regardless of frequency. So if a token has appeared 10 times, it will give the same penalty to it. And if a token has appeared one time, it will also give the same penalty to it. So it will not give penalty based on frequency. See in frequency penalty, if a, a token was occurring many times, then a big penalty was applied. If a token was occurring only few times, then less penalty was applied. Whereas here in presence penalty, that does not happen. Okay, so here you are applying penalty not based on frequency. So if a token has appeared, regardless of how many times it has appeared, same penalty will be applied. So let's see how it works. So the formula is new probability of token equal to previous probability of token multiplied by 1 minus presence penalty value into P of T. Where what is this P of T? So P of T can either be 1 or 0. I'll show you in which scenario to be 1 and which scenario to be 0. Let me explain each of these terms over here. Your P of T stands for original probability of token. It stands for original probability of token. PP stands for the presence penalty value that we set. Okay, and P of T stands for, uh, I mean, it can either have a value of one or a value of zero. In which scenario it will have a value of uh, one if, okay, so it will either have a value of one or zero. In which scenario it will have a value of one if the token has appeared at least once in the response, then P of T for that token will be set to one. Okay. On the other hand, if it has not appeared at all, not even one time, then P of T value will be set to zero. Okay, fine. Let's see how it works. So let's say I have a response uh, generated. And in that response, three tokens have already been generated. Let's say token A, B, A. Now for the fourth place, I want to choose the token. So we know what the model would do internally for every possible token, it will generate a probability value. Okay, so let's say for the token A, it has generated a probability of 0 0.4. For token B, it has generated a probability of 0 0.35. For token C, it has generated a probability of 0 0.25. Now I want to calculate their new probability. So pro new probability of token A equal to previous probability of token A multiplied by 1 minus pre PP value, that means presence penalty value. Let's suppose I'm setting it to 0 0.3. Okay, 0 0.3. So my PP value over here is equal to 0 0.3. Let me set it. Okay, so my presence penalty value is equal to 0 0.3 multiplied by P of T, which can either be 1 or 0. It will be 1 if the token has already appeared once. Uh, however, if the token has not at all appeared at least once, then it will be zero. Okay. In my in my scenario, I'm working with token A. Has token A at least appeared once in the generated response so far? Yes. That that is why P of T value will be equal to one. And if I calculate this, this will be around two zero point two eight. Similarly, new probability of token B equal to previous probability of token B multiplied by one minus presence penalty value into P of T. Has token B appeared in the response so far at least once? Yes. That's why P of T value will be equal to 1. Let's calculate and this will be around 0 0.245. Then let me calculate new probability of token C. Will Q be equal to previous probability of token C? Remember guys that here just like frequency penalty only decreases probability of, do to of those tokens that have already appeared in the generated response. Presence penalty also does the same. If I talk about token C, token C has not appeared in the generated response so far. So hopefully it should probability will not be reduced. Let's see if that happens. So uh, new probability of token C equal to previous probability of token C multiplied by one minus presence penalty value into P of T. 
currently i am working on token c token c has it appeared in my response so far no that's why p of t for token c will be equal to 0 if i solve this this will be around 0 0.25 so previous probability was also 0 0.25 new probability is also 0 0.25 so as expected since token c had not appeared in the generated response so far its probability has not been reduced okay so this is about presence penalty this is about presence penalty let me share the link of the same over here and i've shared the link in the chat let me also mention it in the chat that this is about presence penalty okay i'll just mention it in the chat over here okay i've done it now let me move forward and uh, guys i had explained i have explained to you about frequency penalty presence penalty stop sequences stop p max response however for temperature i told you i will explain to you ahead and now now is the time to explain about temperature parameter so it, let me explain to you how this temperature parameter works okay so we'll just see the working of our temperature parameter over here so let me give a heading of temperature parameter so uh, let's see how it works i'll just give a heading over here so in general what used to happen is uh, in the model what happens is before calculating probabilities for every token for every token a raw score is computed by the model that raw score is known as logits so before calculating probability for every token raw scores are generated those raw scores are known as logits okay those raw scores are known as logics okay so for example let's say we have three tokens cat dog bird let's say for those tokens what will happen you will get these raw scores so logit of token cat let's say could be around two logit of token dog let's say it is around one logit of token bird is around 0 0.1 okay uh, how are these raw scores generated that you will only come to know when you understand how to create a custom ai model but for now uh, since we are not creating any custom ai model we are only using a ready-made model just remember that what will happen is for every token raw scores are generated first then those raw scores are converted to probability how is it converted so without temperature parameter, let me show you how it was getting converted. So without temperature, it used to con get converted using this formula. P equal to exponent of logit of that token divided by summation of exponent of logit of all the tokens. Okay, so let's see. So for example, now, uh, currently, I have calculated logit of the token cat. Let me exponentiate it. So, exponent of logit of token cat will be exponent of 2. Exponent of 2, I guess, is around 7.39. Similarly, let me take exponent of logit of token dog. The logit of token dog is equal to 1. Exponent of 1 is here around uh, 2.72. Similarly, let me take exponent of logit of token bird. Logit of token bird is around 0 0.1. And exponent of uh, 0 0.1 is around 1.11. Okay, so I've calculated these exponents. Now let's move forward. So let's see without temperature parameter how these, uh, how we, we used to get probability calculated. Okay, so let's say I want to calculate probability of token cat. So it will be exponent of logit of token cat, which is equal to 7.39 divided by summation of exponent of logit of all the tokens. Here, if I take the summation, this comes to be around. Uh, if I just take the exponent, it comes around 11.22. Okay, so I'll just substitute 11.22 in my formula. And on calculating, I find that probability of token cat is somewhere around 0 
Similarly, let me calculate probability of token dog, which is equal to exponent of logit of token dog, which is 2.72 divided by summation of logit of all the tokens, which is 11.22. If I do the calculation, it comes to be around 0 0.24. Similarly, probability of token bird will be around logit of token bird, which is 1.1 divided by summation of logit of all the tokens, which is 11.22. If I calculate this, this will be around 0 0.09. So guys, this is how using these raw scores, probability values are obtained. Okay, this is how it used to happen without temperature. Now let's see with temperature parameter, what will happen? So with temperature parameter, the formula will slightly change. So this will be exponent of logit of that token divided by temperature value the whole divided by summation of exponent of logit of all the tokens divided by temperature value okay so here uh, without you can see how is the probability calculate with temperature you can see how the probability is calculated so if the temperature value is high, uh, what will happen is it will lead to uh, lesser probabilities. Okay, so as compared to original probabilities, the new probabilities will be much, much lesser. So if the temperature value is high, it will lead to lesser probabilities and vice versa. If the temperature value is low, it will lead to more higher probabilities and so on. Okay, fine. So with this, what you're trying to do is trying to adjust the probability. So temperature parameter tries to generate new probabilities. Your top pay parameter um, basically tries to play around with probabilities. Presence penalty tries to play around with probabilities. Sorry guys, I got... Sorry guys, I got disconnected in the middle. The point that I was making was uh, the goal of each of these parameters, temperature, top P, frequency penalty, presence penalty, is to have more varied responses. Okay. So guys, did the explanation make sense? Um, presence penalty, frequency penalty, top P, everything. Did the parameters make sense, guys? That internally what is happening within them? Okay. Did make sense, guys? Yes or no? Okay. I'm not getting any response. But is it important from exam perspective? No. I mean, not important from exam perspective. Is that internally you should know? No, that's why. From exam perspective, you should only know how to use the uh, resource. That's all. But internally, you should know. No? That's why I was explaining. Huh, yes, so unless and until we learn how to create custom models, na, these things won't make sense to us. Okay. Uh, but still, we try to have an overview of them. I hope the overview, overview is clear. Okay. But as you view the recording again, and I, once you cover the working of custom models, then it will make more sense to you that, okay, what is this logics and how, how it is generated and so on and so forth. At that time, it will make more sense. But I understand currently, if I just use the term logits that, okay, raw scores are there. How, how are those raw scores generated? That is part of custom model generation, which we are not covering. Okay, in this certification course. Is there any place to read this same? Uh, okay, uh, there is no one place. So I found this information from multiple, multiple places. There is no one place as such. So I'm un unaware if there is any one place out there. Okay, that's why I'm sharing the explanation links in the chat of, of the whiteboards. I'm unsure if there is any one place because when I found out the information, I like 10% I obtained from one blog, another I obtained from documentation and so on. I didn't obtain all of that information from one single place. I don't know now that might be, might be the case, but you don't have to go to any other place. I've given you the links of those whiteboards you can see the explanation from there itself okay so guys with this i showed you how to work with this open ai resource 
without code there is another approach available which is to interact with the open ai resource with code let me show you that and that will that will be the end of our webinar for today okay so i'll create a new folder called open ai service and now let me interact with my resource but i will use the with code approach i have already shown you the without code approach guys now it's time to show you the with code approach so for that first i will have to authenticate to a resource right we'll first have to authenticate so let's go ahead and let's authenticate to a resource in order to do it um, i will need two things first is the endpoint of the resource second is the key of the resource so let's obtain those two things over here. So I'll go to my resource. Let me go to the resource group. Then let me go to my open AI resource. Then on the resource management section, I'll obtain the key and endpoint of the resource. Okay, so I'll need two things to gain access. One is the endpoint of the resource. Second is the key of the resource. Oh, fine. Let's go ahead. Let's mention the same. For uh, gaining authentication, I'll need help of a class which I will import. So from OpenAI file, there is a class called Azure OpenAI. Okay. And let me call this. Let me pass the endpoint of my resource. So I'll pass my endpoint over here. Let me take the endpoint of the resource and paste it in my code. The second thing that I'll pass is the key of my resource. Okay. So let me pass the key. Mm, so over here I will say, uh, let me mention the key. Let me copy it. And let me copy the key and paste it in my coding file. And the third and last thing that I will need is I'll need to mention the API version. Since I'm using the API approach of interacting with the resource, or in other words, since I'm using a coding based approach of interacting with the resource. So I'll need to mention that, okay, which is the API version that I'll use. So OpenAI has created different, different APIs so that there's no traffic on one API only and so on. Okay. With each API, they try to improve the security aspect and so on and so forth. Fine. So let me mention one API version which was developed on 15th of March, 2023. Like that, there are different API versions. You can get that information from the document page. And with, with these three things, I will try to get authentication. I'll try to perform authentication and I will gain access to my resource. Once access to resource has been granted, let me just print a confirmation message to the user that access to resource has been granted. Access to resource has been granted. Okay, fine. Let's go ahead and let's run this. And fine, access to resource has been granted. Now let's go ahead and let's interact with the resource. So we had deployed a model in that resource. Let's work with that. So first, let me generate my messages. I'll pass it it should be passed as a list of dictionaries okay so my input will be called user uh, message okay so i'll say that the role of this message is user message and let me pass the content of that user message you can only pass one user message at a time if you pass multiple then the latest one will be remembered the previous user message will be ignored so you can only pass one user message at a time okay so let me go ahead. That means you can only pass one input at a time. That's what I meant. You can only pass one input at a time. Okay, let me ask it something like, how are you? Okay, fine. Let me pass this message to uh, my resource. So I've already gained access to my resource and I will say that, okay, please do chat completion. We know the model that we deployed is capable of doing that chat completion. So see chat completion is different and just completion is different. In chat completion, you get access to models that remember chat history. In just completion, you get access to models that do not remember chat history. Here we want to use that chat completion capability. And I will say based, uh, use the model and create a response based on the 
so input that i'll be passing so i'll be passing my input to which mo deployed model let me take the name of my deployed model over here so what was my model uh, deployed model name let me go and check i guess it was called test deploy yes the model that we deployed was gpt40 but the name of the deployment is the one that you need to pass over here gpt40 was the model that i deployed but the name of the deployment was called test deploy okay so i'll pass this name test deploy and paste it in my code okay then let's pass the messages so here i'm passing the messages to the model let's go ahead and let's pass it over here then you can mention those settings if you want to like temperature parameter and so on if you don't want to ignore it okay then what will happen default value for those parameters will be taken okay if you do not do not pass a value on your, on your own then default values will be taken no need to worry fine so let's say for temp frequency penalty presence penalty i'm not passing a value no need to worry default values will be taken fine and based on this it will create a response or generate a response let me store the response in a variable and print it out to you currently it will show you a raw response the raw response at first won't make sense we'll try to um you know make this raw response better okay let's see so you can see the raw response the full raw response won't make sense to at first but you can see within the raw response it has given you the output of the model also okay so currently in order to get it uh, i will need to use this class variable called choices so let me do it using that let's see in this class variable called choices what value we have let me run the code again okay it is giving me a list uh, and this entire stuff is one element of that list so in order to get the first element of the list we have to use index 0 with that i'll get the element instead of the list let me do that okay now i'm getting the element instead of the list and in order to get my model's response i need to get it using this uh, class variable called message so let me mention that class variable called message and let's see in that class variable what value has been stored okay so we are getting this entire object that is the value that was stored over there and in order to get my model's response we need to get it using this class variable called content so it is mentioned that over here content and that's it with that uh, you have refined your raw response over here and this is the output that you are getting so you asked it a question how are you and it gave you a response saying thanks for asking and so on and so forth okay like that you can ask any question you can do similar thing that i did earlier as well so if you guys remember earlier what did we do uh, we try to give a direction to the model right so for example if you remember we gave a direction saying give the sentiment of the users input right if you want to do that you can pass the same over here with code as well okay so is this that you will need to enter uh, another message you will call this system message remember your input should always be added at the last before that put other type of message so currently i am passing my system message okay let me pass the content in it uh, give i'm giving a direction that okay give the sentiment of the users input fine it will give the sentiment but then i wanted to customize more what did i want to do i wanted to customize more that okay instead of just giving me a answer saying sentiment is positive or negative which is what it will do currently over here let me go ahead and let me show that to you i will go ahead and run my code over here and uh, let me run it and actually uh, yeah it says currently the sentiment of this users input is neutral let me pass a different message saying this product is good so now it should say a positive sentiment let's see if it does that yes now it says that sentiment of user is positive okay fine 
but instead of giving me this long response i wanted to give me a score based answer just like we did earlier what did we do we used we added examples to communicate the full picture i mean you can communicate the same through system message also but i felt through system message i will not be able to communicate the full picture through words so i felt it was better to give examples so i can give examples using uh, other type of messages like user message and assistant message okay so in user message if you remember we had passed the input saying that if a user asks something like this saying this product is good don't give a full text based answer give a score based answer of plus 1 that okay for positive review give a score of plus 1 similarly if somebody enters a neg negative review give a score of minus 1 similarly if somebody enters a mixed review okay if somebody enters a mixed review then give a score of 0 like that you want to do same thing you can go ahead and do it and for that you will need to pass these examples using the user message field and assistant message field let's do that okay so now i will go ahead and i'll pass those examples let's pass it i'll go ahead and pass it over here okay so for my first example i will say role is user message and what is the content instead of it so what content i passed earlier i'll pass the same over here as well so i'm showing you the same thing that you can do using the without code approach same exact you can do it with the with, the with code approach as well okay and based on that the model i want the model to give a score based answer so in that scenario this will be my assistant message there okay and what is the response that i want my model to give i want my model to give a score based answer of plus 1 okay so this is the first example that i have passed similarly let me pass the second example that if a user asks i enters a input saying this product is bad yes i want to get the sentiment but i want um, to get a score based answer for a negative sentiment give a score based answer of minus 1 similarly if somebody enters a mixed review saying that this product is okay it could have been better so this is a neutral review in a case of a neutral review i want to give it a score of 0 okay fine now let's see what happens over here at the end we are passing my one single output so what is happening i am passing my system message then i am going ahead and i am passing my example this is one example this is second example this is third example and in the end i am passing my input to the model okay so let me pass a input saying that this product is awesome so this is a positive review so hopefully i should get a score of plus 1 let's see if it does that or not yes i do get a score of plus 1 let me enter a negative review uh let me enter something like this product is worse this is worse okay uh then this is a negative review in this scenario i want a uh, uh, score based answer of minus 1 let's see if it does that and yes i do get a score based answer of minus 1 over here similarly you can pass different type of messages again let's see if you pass a negative review something like this product is very very bad this is a negative review in this case you want to assign a score of minus 1 let's see if that happens no no it has assigned minus 2 this should not be the case so that means i should give more examples okay that means i should give more examples so just by one example it has not understood no worries we'll give more examples that if uh, the user enters something like is uh the worst thing that you can buy in that case give a score of minus one only the worst worst thing that you can buy in that case give a score of minus one only okay fine uh, so hopefully now with enough examples now the model understands let me just delete all of this over here and let me run the code again 
okay so i'll click on the run button to run the code and hopefully now it understands that uh, at the end the input that i've passed to the model is a negative review so it gives a score of minus one only and now it understands okay previously it was not understanding it fully but now it understands that even if a word is repeated twice or something give a score of minus one only for the same so like this give more examples guys so the model understands okay more and more examples you pass the better your model will be okay currently it seems just by passing four examples okay sorry i got disconnected in between uh, so the point that i was trying to make was give more and more examples to the model here just by passing four examples it i we i felt that okay the model is doing fairly well but let's say going further if i feel there is some mistake that the model is doing i will give it more examples so that it understands how i want the answer to be and this guys so this field of engineering your response based on your input by the way your input is also known as a prompt so this approach of engineering your response based on your prompt is known as prompt engineering okay this approach of engineering your response based on your prompt is known as prompt engineering so we have also covered the concept of prompt engineering over here okay pravat says uh, ha so pravat in that scenario i i believe this will be a mixed review that you have passed okay let me pass that let me see what it does in my in my view this should be a mixed review because i can see good and bad thing also present over there let's see if it does it uh, if not then i'll have to give more examples for the model to understand yes it understands it as a mixed review for mixed review we have already given an example to it for mixed review give a score of 0 so prabhat as expected it gives a score of 0 Okay, my wish is we get similar responses for product review on Amazon. Means similar analysis of responses. Okay, I'm unsure how you mean similar product review. I mean, but ha, huh, for that you can employ the scoring based system if you want, just like we are doing over here. We are calculating scores. At the end of that, you can take the sum of all these scores and assign that full score to a particular uh, shop. or a restaurant or where wherever okay but i am unsure uh, by repeated reviews what do you mean i have not gone through amazon lately so i am unsure scoring analysis and product advice i mean you can do this similar scoring analysis i mean even if your reviews were not the same i mean uh, were not similar you mentioned that nowadays you are getting acha 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 you mean can the same approach be used over there also ha ha if that what you was is if that what is you are saying you you can i thought you were saying that uh, in amazon you are getting repeated responses something like that ha ha but let's yes in amazon also you get similar thing na so yes same approach you can ap apply there that okay for a, a review you are up, uh, uh, generating a score at the end you will accumulate all the scores you will take the sum of all of it and assign a full score to a particular restaurant like that okay uh, prabhat says can sentiment be assigned using some weightage as in i didn't get your query can sentiment be assigned using some weightage i mean you can customize it in any way although by weightage i'm unsure what you mean but you can customize it in any manner that you like buddy it's up to you i have just given you one system message you can customize it in any manner that you like so prabhat says look look worse is a red flag in manufacturing okay acha so acha so you are saying that for uh, very bad responses assign minus 2 for moderately bad assign minus 1 like that ha huh, you can do that absolutely but then you will have to pass appropriate examples ah huh, buddy 
appropriate examples you will have to pass but ha yeah, absolutely you can do that is is that you will have to pass appropriate examples so that the model can understand that okay this response sorry this input belongs to very bad review so that means assign a score of minus 2 this review is moderately bad so assign a score of minus 1 okay so i mean you can even do that in your uh, system message you can pass that information okay that for negative reviews give a score of minus 1 or minus 2 for very bad reviews give a score of minus 2 and for moderately bad reviews give a score of minus 1 so you have communicated the full picture over here but if you feel that okay just through words maybe the model might not understand you can go ahead and pass examples so absolutely you can absolutely you can do that buddy okay absolutely you can do that so we can implement any scoring methodology that you like and it will be implemented there is no way it will not be implemented try it it will be implemented definitely okay is this that sometimes just by system message the model might not understand the full story so you will have to give appropriate examples below that's all okay so that's it guys for this webinar i wanted to cover three services one was speech service another was document intelligence third was open ai service i hope it made sense to you okay um if there are any doubts you can ask me or that will be the end of our today's webinar so the recording will be uploaded on our official youtube channel okay i hope uh, you guys have filled the feedback of the webinar it was uploaded by rc in the chat earlier i hope the feedback has been filled so yeah that's it for today's webinar guys thank you so much for attending and hopefully we will meet again in our upcoming webinar where we'll try to cover more stuff i hope you learned something of value today and uh, uh, do in stay in touch with us if you have any doubts or anything you can contact uh, social media pages and you can ask over there and we'll definitely help you out for exam perspective is there more scoring areas not more scoring areas as such prabhat what happens is you will get questions asked based on um for example let me show you one such question okay there is no scoring area as such but let me show you one such question that has already been asked in the examination so based on the stuff that you do for example let me show you a question related to open ai okay let me show you a question over here related to open ai where is it where is it uh ha huh. here it is sorry so here is the question it says you have a this is a actual question by the way that has been asked in the examination it says you have a open ai model named ai1 okay you are building a web application named app1 by using open ai code based approach you need to configure app1 to connect to ai1 okay so what are the three things that you need okay so you tell me guys we have just written a code and what are the three things that we need model name do we need the model name no we don't need the model name guys we need deployment name model name is not required okay so option 1 cancelled option 2 also says model name model name is not required deployment name is required option 3 Okay, so is deployment name, endpoint, and key. Yes, these were the three things that we had passed. If you look at our code over here, these were the three things. You can see endpoint is passed, right? Endpoint is passed here. Key is passed here. Then your deployment name is passed below. So these are the three things that I did pass. So the correct answer is option C over here. so this is a type of question that will be asked in your examination this is a real question that has been asked in your examination like that you will get similar questions you might get asked questions as based on network um settings and so on okay uh, for example let me show you one such set uh, uh, question so i showed you that network setting right 
uh, uh, wherein there were three options. Uh, in one, you create a public endpoint and it's accessible to everyone. In the second network option, it's you have a public endpoint, but it's only accessible to certain IP addresses. In the third option, third network option, uh, you are not using a public endpoint. You are using a private endpoint on a private network. Okay, so based on that, there is a question. What does the question say? The question says you are creating a web app. See, all of these things, most of the things mentioned over here will confuse you. Okay, fine. So it says there is a web app named App One that runs on a virtual machine called so and so. Okay, fine. You have this stuff. It's there to confuse you. So it says you deploy a service with a public endpoint and configure. Okay, yeah. so this is the solution. What is the problem mentioned? It says you are creating a web application. That, okay, uh, that is running on a VM. That VM is in a virtual network named VM VNet One. You plan to create a okay resource of that service, and you need to ensure that App One can connect to service without routing. Okay, so guys, if you are uh, uh, if you do not want to use public internet, that means if you want to use private network. Guys, in a private network, okay. If you want to use a private network, in a private network, will I ever use a public endpoint? It's not possible. It's not possible. I'd explain that network setting to you. So, guys, if I want to use a private network, it says do not route uh, do not route the traffic over public internet. That means use private network. In a private network, we use private endpoint. However, here in the solution, it says in a private network, we'll use a public endpoint. From this word itself, I can cross this out that no, this is not the solution. So the correct answer is no for this. That no, this is not the solution. And you will see correct answer is no. Similarly, moving forward, even here, it is asking the same thing that we do not want to route over public internet. That means use private network. On a private network, it is asking me a solution to use public endpoint. In a private network, we cannot use public endpoint. We have to use private endpoint only. Okay, so again, from here itself, I know the right answer is no. Okay, even here. Okay, the right answer is no. What about this guys? Here it is asking me to not route traffic using the public internet. That means use private network. So on a private network guys, can we use a private endpoint? Yes or no? Yes or no guys? On a private network, can we use a private endpoint? Yes. So the correct answer for this is yes. So like this questions will be asked to you. Okay, so when you did that form filling now, so you need to understand what is the meaning behind each of those fields. Like I explained to you, you need to understand the meaning behind everything. Then if a question is asked based on any of those fields, then you will be easily able to answer it. So like that question will be asked, but if you are asking about any particular area as such, um, there's no particular area that I can point out. Each service is equally important. Okay. Can you get exam dumps? Okay, I'll have to see it in my current repository if I have. If I have, then I will try to share. Fine. So that is it for today's webinar, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. You learned something of value. We'll meet again in our upcoming webinar where we'll understand more things. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, yes, welcome Prabhat and thank you everybody. And we'll meet again hopefully in our upcoming webinar. Okay, thank you everyone and bye. Bye guys. Guys, don't forget to fill this feedback form. I already shared on chat box.